Dr. Ogosh, I cannot hear you right now. Okay, is everything going on? Yes. Yes, yes I can hear. Good morning, <clears throat> my dear colleagues. Hello from Istanbul. If you could perform this meeting uh, face to face, but it's a, a great pleasure to be with you. Okay, uh, would you please let me to introduce you first? Do you want me to introduce you first or, or, or it's okay that you start? Everything that you want. I don't understand you. Uh, Do you want me to introduce you first? No. Uh, good morning and welcome to the fifth Congress of Iranian Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologies, International Day. Thanks to all these professors, these great uh, scientists for being here today. You know, this scientific conference was scheduled to be held on February and was canceled just a few days before its beginning because of COVID-19 pandemic. During the outbreak of the disease, we lost Professor Dr. Esmail Yazdi, the founder of oral and maxillofacial pathology in Iran. And this virtual conference is a tribute to him. I would also uh, thank the Iranian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences for their valuable and continuous support in holding this conference. Uh, uh, despite all the unfortunates of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it has somehow connected us to each other, like gathering us here today from different countries as we have uh, participants from 40 countries around the world here in this room. Uh, today we will have three scientific panels with great scientists and uh, um, brilliant uh, panel uh, moderators and lecturers. The first panel is odontogenic cysts and tumors. I am honored to introduce the, um, a great scientist who is the moderator of the first panel, Professor Dr. Nijat Bakur Olgach. Uh, he's a great scientist that has uh, over 100 publications in the field of oral pathology. He's a professor of oral pathology and head of the Department of uh, Tumor Pathology uh, Institute of Oncology in Istanbul University in Turkey. I'm so honored, Professor, to have you here today. Please welcome. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Good morning, my dear colleagues. Uh, hello from Istanbul. We should perform this meeting face to face, but uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you, even in online. Uh, and thank you, uh, I'm thankful to Iranian uh, Oral Maxillofacial Pathologies Association uh, for invite, uh, inviting us the, this wonderful organization. There is a very nice, soft, but uh, dynamic morning, uh, autumn morning in Istanbul. First panel of the day is a workshop which is going to be presented by Dr. Marwa Soluk Tekkeşin about odontogenic cysts and tumors. Dr. Marwa is a very valuable person for me. When she had, a, when she had come to our department as a tiny, newly graduated PhD student, it was clearly seen that she was gifted, intelligent, and hard worker, the surgeon. During the years, she proved this exceedingly. Now she became an associated professor in our department and European Counselor of uh, Association of Oral Pathology, European Association of Oral Pathology, and one of the writers of the head and neck uh, section of the blue books are holy books, uh, World Health Organizations, uh, and I am very proud of her. He, uh, it's a big honor to me to uh, present you, Dr. Tekkeşin, to performing her lecture and workshop uh, here. Dear participants, would you please write your questions and contributions uh, to the chat box, please? Uh, they uh, transmit to, to me and I will uh, ask you for, uh, to Marwa uh, after the uh, workshop, okay? 
Yes, uh, Marwa Soluk Tekkeşin, uh, would you please start your lecture? Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone from lovely Istanbul morning. Firstly, let me wish you all good health and hope that you and your families have not been affected by these difficult times. I hope the world gets rid of this danger as soon as possible. And my deep sadness for all Iranian colleagues. Well, I'm sorry to hear this. And thanks so much for this kind invitation and also very, very kind introduction, my dear mentor, Dr. Olgaç. I'm now sharing my screen. Actually, as the Dr. Nazanin mentioned, uh, this workshop was going to be held in Tehran in February, and it is canceled for the obvious reason just two days because, uh, before the Congress. Uh, we were through organizing it in February, the Istanbul side and the Tehran side for this workshop, and we are expecting to just only Iranian colleagues. But now we are third organization and considering the different countries, the third organization work much better than us. I think we have to admit that the third organization was coronavirus. Just trying to see the good side of the, this uh, pandemic uh, process. But it's, it's really, uh, I, I'm really, uh, miss your hospitality and really looking forward to face-to-face -to -face meeting uh, soon. This is our workshop which we held uh, in 2014 and 2018. Uh, I'm looking forward to see you uh, very soon, I hope. Uh, before starting the workshop, I want to summarize briefly the changes of the last WHO classification. After the 12 years, just I want to, yeah. Uh, after the 12 years, the edition serves to provide an update classification scheme and extended genetic and molecular data that are useful as diagnostic tools for the lesion of the head and neck region. The last classification has some important differences from the third edition, including a new classification of odontogenic cysts reclassified odontogenic tumor and some new entities. We will look at all these changes briefly with this order. Let's start with the odontogenic carcinomas. This session includes numerous updates from the third edition, from the third edition. especially metastasizing amyloblastoma was subclassified under the amyloblastoma group because of its benign features. While a majority of the experts agreed to move this lesion from malignant to benign, this decision was not unanimous. In the 2005 classification, amyloblastic carcinoma was also changed and become narrowed. Uh, in the third edition, the amyloblastic carcinoma uh, were divided into three different categories primary type, secondary type interests, and the secondary type peripheral types. Now, these tumors are classified under the amyloblastic carcinoma based on the morphologic continuum and similar behavior between these entities. Like amyloblastic carcinomas, the primary introduced carcinoma carcinomas were all, was also narrowed and became a single entity. It had previously been divided into three different categories based on the, their histogenesis. Clear cell odontogenic carcinoma and ghost cell odontogenic carcinoma still continue in the last classification, but we have a new baby here. It's a cyclorizing odontogenic carcinoma. I haven't seen any case of a cyclorizing odontogenic carcinoma yet, so I just give some uh, information from the literatures. It was described in 2008, and there is no gender predilection, and it was introduced as a primary introduced carcinoma of the jaw with aggressive infiltration. Mandible is much more affected than the maxillary sites, and it's a low grade with mild 
atypia and impregnant mitosis histologically, but diffusely infiltrative with perineural spreading. But actually, for my opinion, this tumor needs genetic and molecular characterization to fortify it being a separate entity from the other carcinomas, or is it just the pattern of the other carcinomas? Uh, we have to keep in mind that it is an exclusion diagnosis. We have to exclude metastasis, which is much more common in the jaw, epithelium-rich odontogenic fibroma, desmoplastic ameloblastoma, calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor, clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. After we exclude all these diagnoses, we can go with the sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma. What can we see in the histopathologically. Uh, it's a small single file cores and strands of epithelium in a dense stroma, but sometimes it's really difficult to observe these epithelial islands. So CK19 highlights the epithelium to see and give the diagnosis. Uh, the treatment uh, is the main treatment is resection. Uh, to date, no metastasis have been reported yet, but the cases are really rare in the literatures. And the overall prognosis is good. Uh, I think it's a behavior like other low-grade carcinomas of the jaw. When we look at the odontogenic sarcomas, in 2005, they were classified as amyloblastic fibrosarcoma, amyloblastic fibrodentinosarcoma and fibroodontosarcoma, depending on whether and which dental heart tissues were formed. Now, these malignant tumors are collected under the umbrella of odontogenic sarcomas. And it has been uh, clarified that most common type is amyloblastic fibrosarcoma, which is the malignant counterpart of amyloblastic fibroma, which we will mention in later. We have a, not a new baby. We can say the child coming back home uh, because the carcinosarcoma was described in 1992 classification, but in, uh, it's eliminated from the 2005 classification because most of the cases published were period immunistic chemistry and current diagnostic criteria. Uh, but now odontogenic carcinoma has been uh, has been accepted again in 2017 edition because of the cases with adequate immunohistochemical chemical and the or molecular support. Uh, and the prognosis is poor uh, as other carcinomas occurred in the different region of the body. When we look at the benign tumors, in 2005, the title is so long and so complex. Now, in the last classification, uh, includes a simpler format, such as epithelial odontogenic tumor, mixed odontogenic tumor, and mesenchymal odontogenic tumor. It's, uh, it's easy to remember and also use. Let's start with the epithelial benign odontogenic tumor. Uh, this is the most notable changes was done in this category. And one of the major change in this group is the update amyloblastoma types based on the current genetic studies. You can see the last uh, previous classification in the left column and the new one in the uh, right column. The term solid and multicystic was dropped because of the conventional amyloblastoma show cystic generation with no biologic differentiation. So we just use amyloblastoma now. And still we have peripheral type and unicystic type, but desmoplastic type just undergo to the other uh, histologic subtype instead of becoming a separate entity. We have here just mentioned that metastasizing amyloblastoma came here. Squamous odontogenic tumor, classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor, adnumentate odontogenic tumor uh, still have a place in the new classification. Uh, of course, with some additional genetic and molecular uh, addition. And the, maybe the, the most notable change in this tumor group is that characteristic odontogenic tumors of 2005 are now classified under the development of odontogenic cysts with the name of the 
odontogenic keratokis. I think we are all happy for this. When we look at the mixed benign odontogenic tumor differences, in, uh, some major changes were also made in this classification scheme for this tumor group, uh, especially odontoamyloblastoma was excluded from the study. Because the amyloblastic areas is odontomas do not justify a separate entity, and in fact, the combination of amyloblastoma and odontoma histologically is more likely to be an amyloblastoma arising in the odontomas from primitive ectodyne. Uh, maybe the, the most challenging uh, topics of this classification is that amyloblastic fibroma, yes, again have a place in the new classification, but amyloblastic fibrodontoma and fibrodentinoma, uh, we can say, I think, excluded from this uh, classification. Uh, and they said that uh, there is some evidence that once dental heart tissues are formed, these lesions are programmed to develop into the odontomas. This is very controversial subject. We will discuss in the workshop cases this. Classifying odontogenic, another uh, important changes in this classification, classifying cystic odontogenic tumor were, was excluded from the, this tumor scheme and moved back to, into the development cyst category as with the classifying odontogenic cyst name, because there was no evidence presented that the cystic classifying odontogenic tumor uh, were neoplastic. So now it is under the uh, odontogenic cyst classification. Here again, we have a new baby. Uh, it's a primordial odontogenic tumor. Please don't confuse that. This is uh, not a primordial odontogenic cyst which is one of the old names of the odontogenic keratokis. Uh, some old, I, so, so I'm so rude. Okay, some experience were still used the primordial odontogenic cyst for the odontogenic keratosis. But this is absolutely different entity, primordial odontogenic tumor. Uh, I haven't seen any cases uh, yet for this uh, new uh, tumor. Uh, it's just described in 2014, and I think it's a very lucky tumor and described in 2014 and have a place in the mean classification 2017. The main age about 13 and no sex predilection and mandible uh, much more affected than the maxillary bone. Uh, it's usually, uh, almost always associated with the unerupted tooth and expansion is the very characteristic feature in clinically. This is the pictures from the, the paper, uh, the, which is to describe this entity. And all these diff different four uh, cases uh, has a very large uh, swelling with an erupted tooth, radiolucent lesion with a sclerotic border. Uh, what can we see in the uh, histopathologically? Primordial odontogenic tumor composed of the cellular loose fibrous tissue with areas similar to dental papilla and completely surrounded by the columnar epithelium resembling the internal epithelium of the animal organ. Uh, and all cases for now uh, were treated with conservative surgery and no recurrence has been reported yet. And maybe the discussion arises here if we say that uh, amyloblastic fibroodontoma and dentinoma is odont developing odontoma. And here, young age group, and maybe somewhere in the odontoma developing, this is open the discussion. Mesenchymal uh, benign odontogenic tumor. There were no major changes for <coughs> mesenchymal odontogenic tumor in the fourth edition, with the exception of the addition of the term of semantic ossifying fibroma here. A small changes were also made for the odontogenic fibroma classification. In 2005, odontogenic fibroma applied to two histologic types of lesion the epithelium rich, poor type, we can say, or epithelium poor types. In the current classification, the subtypes were excluded due to the poorly defined and uh, documented epithelial poor types. 
And now the WHO classification defines odontogenic fibroma as a rare neoplasm of the mature fibrous connective tissue with variable amounts of inactive looking odontogenic epithelium with or without evidence of classification. Uh, just a few words I want to say for the semantic ossifying fibroma. Semantic ossifying fibroma has been very easily called ossifying fibroma, semantifying fibroma, or semantic ossifying fibroma. The last classification choose the last one, semantic ossifying fibroma, because of its descriptive value, and maybe more importantly, it was classified under odontogenic tumor to dis distinguish it from the juvenile types. However, it is still histopathologically fibroosseous lesions and discuss in detail with the other ossifying fibromas in the fibroosseous lesions section of the last WHO classification. When we look at the odontogenic uh, cis classification, there has been no definitive revision of the classification of odontogenic cis since, since uh, 1992, because the 2005 WHO classification of the head and neck tumors did not include odontogenic cysts. And here, as we mentioned, two most significant changes in the last classification. Odontogenic keratocysts and calcifiance odontogenic cysts are not a uh, tumor anymore, and they are development odontogenic, odontogenic cysts. Here, we have a new term, but it's not a new entity. Actually, it was uh, described in 1981 by uh, Professor White uh, and uh, one of the type of the odontogenic keratitis. But now we know that orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst is a different distinct entity. It's not uh, any relationship there with odontogenic keratosis. Anti-inflammatory cysts have a few changes in the last classification. In the, two, uh, in the 1992 classification, this group was divided into radicular cyst with subclassification and periodontal cyst. In the last classification, there were two main types for the inflammatory cysts. One is radicular cysts with the mentioned the lateral and residual cysts under the head of the radicular cysts. And the other is Inflammatory cysts, uh, the collateral inflammatory cysts uh, collected under the name of this and which has been used for the first time in the classification, collateral inflammatory cysts. It consists of the periodontal cysts and mandibular buccal bifurcation cysts, right, which is arising on the buccal surface of the eruptive lower first and second molars. The only non-odontogenic cyst mentioned in the last classification is uh, nasopolitin duct cyst. After this be very brief uh, change summarizing uh, from the last edition, uh, you can find all these uh, changes very deeply in this review paper, which was written by me and Professor Wright. Uh, and I want to thank, in, with the RC letters, uh, thank you for kind attention for this part of the workshop. Uh, but before uh, starting a workshop, uh, we, a few minutes, in a few minutes, we will start. But I would like to say a few words for Turkey and Iran relation. These two countries are not only neighbors, but also share a very common culture. Both countries have lands in the Mesopotamia region where the humanity was born. And Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi is an Anatolian mystic, poet, and philosopher, and has important place in both cultures. He wrote his most important work, Mesnevi, you can see in the screen, in Farsi, the official language of Iran. Although it was not our official language in our history, the literature language almost always be Farsi. The Rumi's doctorate, most of you know this uh, famous poem with Rumi name, and his doctrine advocates unlimited tolerance, positive reasoning, goodness, charity, and awareness through love. 
I think it would be enough to know the seven advice he gave to humanity to understand the Rumi philosophy. This, this, uh, her ad, his advice will be with us during the workshop among the cases and highlights our road with some traditional Sufi music. Let's start with the most famous and important, uh, sorry, also uh, the Mesnevi uh, translating to many language, this is the English version. And her uh, very important uh, advice to humanity either appear as you are or be as you look. Now it is time to workshop cases. Uh, let me just stop my share. And continue with the uh, workshop. I know that making a diagnosis, of course, include all this, uh, sorry, just I want to, oh. so I couldn't see the screen coolly. Now, yes, of course, to make a diagnosis needs all these three important features, clinical features, radiological features, if we see uh, looking through the intraosseous lesions and histopathology. We have to evaluate all these three important parts uh, before making a diagnosis. And history is almost everything. I know most of you go look through the slides uh, before uh, the workshop, uh, which we sent you uh, as a link, uh, but you know a very little clinical informa information. Just I want to make you some brainstorming, but no, I will give, especially for the uh, some lesions, I will give very important clinical uh, features for you. And let's start with the case one. 35 years old female patients and nodular lesion on the gingival between her lower right promolars. Uh, this is the only lesion, uh, this uh, extra osseous lesion. Other, all the uh, workshop cases uh, are in the intra osseous cases. Let's look at the histopathology clear. I'm using the online live pet presenter screen. Uh, so just uh, this is see what you see in your link, uh, but uh, to save the time, I made some uh, an uh, annotation uh, to uh, save time. So we can see here very nice surface epithelium. And under the, this epithelium, a little bit of the free zone here you can see, and the very large solid tumor mass, tumor mass we can see. Just I want to open my uh, annotations. Uh, to be quicker. Yes, if we see this amyloblastic epithelium, uh, the diagnosis is easier. Uh, how can we call this is amyloblastic epithelium? Uh, amyloblastic uh, epithelial islands, especially for the basal layer of these uh, islands, show a hyperchromatism, palisading, and especially a reverse nuclei. What it's mean reverse nuclei? It's the nuclei away from the basement membrane. And also this uh, cells resembling this satellite reticulum. All these features make us this is epithel uh, amyloblastic epithelium. What can we see other? This is the amyloblastic epithelium uh, we're seeing most of the this scan, scan it slides. Another very nice cells, I'm sure everybody got, get this, and the ghost cells, we have ghost cells. In the odontogenic tumor, there are two distinct lesion with the ghost cells. One is a dentinogenic ghost cell tumor, uh, other is calcified odontogenic cyst, and other is ghost cell odontogenic carcinoma. Without uh, if we see, without seeing the ghost cells, we, uh, we are not able to give this third diag uh, three diagnosis. So what we have now, amyloblastic epithelium, ghost cells, and the very large areas we can see dentinoid material. Some areas very nice for the, uh, this, uh, maybe here, and yeah, 
you can see large epite amyloblastic epithelial islands, very large accumulation of ghost cells. And you can see here again, dentinoid-like material. So all with these three features, uh, our diagnosis should be extraosseous dentinogenic ghost cell tumor. It is sharing the same histopathologic feature as their uh, intraosseous counterpart. Uh, it is quite rare yeah. and conservative excision is the treatment of choice and the recurrence is rare. So just to, to summarize the extraosseous odontogenic tumor, uh, especially odontogenic fibroma and amyloblastoma have uh, the extraosseous odontogenic virants, uh, which is much more common, but other odontogenic tumors uh, can be seen uh, extraosseous. Uh, it's usually um, seems a nodular lesion in the clinically, and it's impossible to distinguish it from other nodular lesion of the gingiva at the clinic. So it's usually get the diagnosis by the pathologist. Case two, 37 years old male patient with mild swelling, a well-defined right descent lesion of the left posterior sides. We can see the radiology. Radiology is the very important part of the uh, bone lesions. So I I'm sure you uh, didn't see this uh, radiology, uh, but now we are discussed together with the histopathologic and radiologic features together. You can see here very, very large lesions and with the sclerotic lesion, radial stand with the sclerotic borders. And the just I want to take your attention here to, for the growth pattern. It's the anterior to posterior side uh, growth pattern this lesion shows. It's very classic for some of the odontogenic lesions. Uh, of course, this is not a, a good uh, choice to uh, develop, uh, evaluate the uh, expansion, but you can see not a very uh, distinct extension with these uh, radiological features. I'm sure this is a very straightforward case for you. Uh, I want to open my notions. Okay, what can we see here? Of course, we see pericaritinized corrugated surface you can see here. When we close up, you can see at the basal layer and the very uh, palisading uh, basal cell nuclei. Uh, and when we look at the at love power, it's the cystic lesion, of course. Uh, and sometimes we can see daughter cysts on the wall. But I want to uh, highlight that if this epithelium uh, goes to the secondary inflammation, there is no specific feature uh, behind them. So if the incisional biopsy came from the, the inflammation site, it's impossible to give the uh, odontogenic keratosis diagnosis from these pieces or uh, such pieces. So the importance of the clinical features and the radiological features, again, so important uh, to evaluate the inflammation odontogenic cysts. Okay. Why so different odontogenic keratosis? In one classification is a tumor, in the other classification is this in the cyst. And lots of lots of studies in the literatures because it has a high proliferation rate and high recurrence rate compared with the other odontogenic cysts. And especially associated with the golden gold syndrome and PTCH mutation, uh, the third classification, just because of these uh, features, uh, think that uh, and accept that this unique odontogenic cyst was a neoplasm. But now uh, the WHO classification says that further research is needed, but at the present time, there appears to be insufficient evidence to support a neoplastic origin of odontogenic keratosis. So the most appreciated name for this lesion, odontogenic keratosis, and we are continuing to use odontogenic keratosis keratosis now. I have a bonus case here, and I am really wondering about what will you think about these cases. Uh, this is 60 years old 
uh, male patient. Uh, by the way, you didn't see in the work, uh, in the link uh, which we sent you this case. You can see this case now. Right descent lesion of the right posterior maxillary bone, and the clinical diagnosis is residual cyst. Yes, you can see here a radial descent lesion with the well defined, but here you can see some bone destruction here. When we look at the histologically, it's some uh, the microscopic uh, of the, this lesion, it's some solid uh, fragments. Also, the fragments consist of such a multiple cyst and small epithelial islands. Maybe we can see here, as you can see, it's a very obvious cystic lying, and maybe we can say a palisading at the basal layer and the other uh, small cyst like tissues. Uh, we can see here, yes, you can see here a very nice palisading uh, basal layer with the, we can say, corrugated surface here. And some of these uh, cystic uh, areas containing in some funny cells, maybe, I, I'm not sure these are amyloblastic. I couldn't say these epithelium amyloblastic, but it is really open the discussion. I'm wondering what you think. Yes, a very nice, again, it looks like keratosis. It uh, seems keratosis and it's small epithelial island on the cis wall. Another uh, low, uh, high power of the one uh, cystic areas. I'm not sure we can call these the amyloblastic features. So uh, if you ask me for my diagnosis, I called this, uh, really challenging case as solid type odontogenic keratosis. What did you say WHO classification for this variant? Occasionally, odontogenic keratosis are some of the so-called solid variants composed of multiple small cysts and epithelial islands in a dense collagenous stroma, which is described and which is the features of the other cases. And of course, uh, acantomatous amyloblastoma and squamous cell carcinoma in our differential diagnosis. But we don't know the true nature of this variant and its relationship to conventional odontogenic keratosis. I think uh, the further surgery is really neat. I know some very large studies in the literature, and one of them from my country and by Dr. Bunhan and et al. Okay, case three. 26 years old female patients, asymptomatic patients, uh, and incidental radiologic finding, we will see here. Yes, you can see a uh, an erupted tooth surrounding by the radiolucent lesion with a very well-defined sclerotic borders. And again, we can see the uh, cyst-like tissue here and the connective tissue wall and the very thin uh, epithelial lying. When we focus on the one side, we can see the strophoid uh, squamous epithelium lining with the really over keratinization, over orthokeratinization, and very, very prominent granular cells, most of the station of this, oh, maybe here again, uh, we can see very nice granularization on this cystic lesion. And uh, be careful that there is no palisading on the basal layer. I'm sure most of the, you get the, this is a, again straightforward cases. This is orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst. It is quite rare. Uh, as we said, it's described in, in 1981 uh, as a kind of a type of uh, odontogenic keratosis, but now we are know that orthokeratinized odontogenic keratosis is not associated with the gordon gold syndrome, high recurrence rates, or high proliferation rates. So this is a distinct, different entity. And the peak incidence in the third and fourth decades of life, and the slightly male predilection. 
and the uh, ninety percent of the cases occur in mandible, with about seventy five percent of these lesions uh, tend to uh, prefer to occur posterior regions. So, just to summarize, there is no two types of keratosis. Odontogenic keratosis, keratosis always parakeratinized, or the keratinized epithelium always uh, consists with the different entity, which we call orthokeratinized odontogenic cysts. Okay, uh, after these uh, keratocystic lesions, I think it is time to uh, take uh, some advice from Rimi with the very traditional Sufi music. Okay, let's continue with the case four. 21 years old male patient with the paleness mild swelling and reticent lesion of the anterior maxillary bone. And when we look at the radiological features, you can see again what embedded tooth here and the surrounding a, a large radiocent lesion with this sclerotic border you can see. Also root movement and the root resorption uh, seen here uh, very nicely. I think this is the classical example of, if you, if you know this entity, this is a very classical example and a very nice one. So, this is again cyst-like tissue and the epithelial lining have some special features. Let's look at them. Again, we have a amyloblastic epithelium here. Sometimes for this lesion, we can see that this reverse polarization Hello, dear Merva. We cannot hear you. The picture is also stopped. Are you connected? Okay, we will try to connect to her in a few minutes. We will be back soon. Oh, she's back now. Merva, can you hear me? Do we have your voice? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, so just where we were, uh, I think everybody get these slides, right? Nazini? Yes. Would you, would you, uh, Dr. Olgach, would you please guide me? Everybody see this? Yes, yes I, I think everybody see the slides very well. Okay, okay, I'm continue. Let's, okay. Uh, so we have again, amyloblastic epithelium here, ghost cells here, and now we have a cystic lesion. So our diagnosis would be classifying odontogenic cyst. And it's a quite rare cyst again, and with a wide age range, with the mean about 30 years. 
especially the cases associated with the odontoma peak incidence in the second decade of love, uh, life and the predilection for the anterior maxillary and the no gender predilection. Both jaw can be affected acutely and usually the anterior regions. Enucleation is the treatment of choice and recurrence is quite rare. Case number five. 25 years old male patient. It's an incidental finding in the radiology again. Uh, we can see here uh, large radiolucent lesions uh, with, uh, how can I say this? Uh, not so well defined, but we can see the borders here. It's a very uh, interesting and nice example of for this uh, lesion. Again, we see the very uh, nice cyst-like tissue with the connective tissue wall and the epithelial lying here. When we close uh, look at the epithelial lying, uh, we will see some different uh, features. I like to use this Oops, here. I like to this red, white, blue effect terminology. It's not a classical amyloblastic epithelium, but this is a very hyper, uh, hyper uh, chromatic basal layer and a very uh, uh, odonomatous uh, epithelium uh, similar to satellite reticulum, but not so well formed. And the other is the, you can see here, another uh, layer. Uh, if you catch these sites, the diagnosis is more easy because it's no doubt that these epithelial islands are amyloblastic. But if we get any site here, if we get such an incisional biopsy, it is impossible to make the correct diagnosis from such, uh, such an epithelium lying. So we have to carefully uh, examine whole slides here again. It's a little bit uh, different from the other odontogenic cysts, but it's really difficult to say uh, this is the amyloblastic epithelium for this site. You know, if we are lucky, we catch these sites, or we have to know that this site is really typical for the, this unique uh, lesion, unicystic amyloblastoma. We have three types of unicystic amyloblastoma. One is luminal unicystic amyloblastoma. You can see here the amyloblastoma uh, differenti uh, differentiates uh, and changes just only the epithelial lying. But intraluminal unicystic amyloblastoma, this uh, projects, in, uh, projects into the lumen with the amyloblastic, especially the plexiform type. But if we see the Mural unicystic amyloblastoma, we can see some odontogenic uh, amyloblastic epithelial islands on the cyst wall. Not only uh, epithelium, not only intranumal site, also uh, we have to see the, this uh, amyloblastic epithelium on the mural, mural site. So we know that this mural unicystic amyloblastoma can behave differently from these two types. So uh, we will discuss what the WHO says, but the uh, treatment, this moral unicystic amyloblastoma needs further treatment. Uh, just to summarize for all types of unicystic amyloblastoma, uh, it occurs uh, five to 20% of all amyloblastomas. Uh, the age is different, especially with an impacted tooth, uh, the mean age, a second decade, uh, but the absence of the impaction tooth, uh, the third decade is the more common. A slight pale predilection, most often located in the mandibular third molar area and the ramus, and the most maxillary cases tend to occur in the posterior areas too. When we look at the treatment, actually, uh, the radiographically mimics a cystic lesion. So initial treatment often consists of the enucleation. After the uh, diagnosis made by the pathologist, further treatment is determined by the pattern and extent of the amyloblastomatous proliferation. And the, who recommended that? A moral type case should be treated 
is a conventional amyloblastoma when it recurs. It's very important for the clinician, I think. Case six, 60, uh, 70 years old uh, female patient with swelling, uh, multidocular radiodescency involving the posterior mandible. We can see a very, very classical uh, honey cup, uh, soap bubble uh, appearance, multidocular appearance here. Uh, Many times, this is very classical radiodicative feature for these uh, cases. Uh, I'm sure you also get the um, easily from the uh, histopathological uh, slides. And when we uh, compare it with this radiology, I think you all know the uh, diagnosis now. What we have here, we mentioned lots of the amyloblastic epithelium in different cases, but this is the main amyloblastic uh, lesion. Uh, I like to uh, use this ibiker gorlin criteria. In fact, this criteria was made for the unicystic amyloblastoma uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning, but now we can use for all types of the, uh, amyloblastic cases. What are these? This is hyperchromatism and palisading and also polarization, reverse polarization from the basal layer, you can see. Also, if we see the vocalization, you can see here, here, here. And this is also very nice criteria for the weaker scoring criteria. Uh, vocalization, all these features uh, belongs to the basal layer. Uh, vocalization, hyperchromatism, palisading, and the reverse polarization. This type of amyloblastoma, especially histologically, predominant with the follicular type, but we can also see some plexiform areas and squamous metaplasia. Until now, we don't know any differences between the histological types. Uh, I think it's enough aggressive for uh, all types of the amyloblastoma. Uh, if we exclude odontomas, the most common odontogenic tumor is the amyloblastoma. It's a very uh, wide age range, and approximately 20% of the cases occur in the mandible, especially the posterior region. Only desmoplastic amyloblastoma tend to occur the anterior region of the jaws and especially maxilla, and its radiological features really resembling the uh, fibroosseous lesions. And the treatment is really different uh, and differs from the case to case. White surgical resection with 1.5 centimeter free margins, margins uh, especially for the large and really uh, soup bubble uh, lesions, but if we have a small amyloblastic cases, I think we have to try the conservative surgery and wait uh, until it recurs. Case number seven, 21 years old male patient, asymptomatic, and the radiolucent lesion of the right posterior mandible ramus. I am really wondering about what did you think about this case? This is a very challenging case, I think. But we can see radiology here as a very blunt and a very nice, well-defined sclerotic border radiolucent lesion and unilocular radiolucent lesion we can see here. And this is the uh, microscopic slides, whole slide imaging. I didn't make any annotation here because all the uh, all areas are the same and similar to each other. We can see basolate cells with usual bilayer and anastomizing each other. There is no distinct uh, connective tissue or stroma uh, among the, these uh, cords. And what we have here, actually, it's we can see again. Uh, Maybe you can get some cue from this part of the uh, lesion here. Uh, and what we have here, basolate cells with the long course anastomizing each other. 
yeah, really, if I had a chance, what you think, I'm really happy to hear your diagnosis for this one. Again, another piece here. Maybe some, we are a little bit at different areas maybe, but this, if you get the correct diagnosis, I think you get from the these sites with this, uh, a little bit plexiform areas. If you ask me what is my diagnosis, my diagnosis was ameloblastoma for this challenging case. We always know that the plexiform ameloblastoma with the classical variant, but it's uh, known that two different patterns for plexiform and this one is dentalomula like pattern. Uh, some accept this, some not, but I accept this dentalomula like pattern for the ameloblastoma, especially appears mostly in the posterior bandible. Uh, yes, this is a very uh, interesting and challenging case, this, and it's open to discussion. And uh, maybe uh, I know. Uh, one colleague said that this is adenocarcinoma metastasis. It's not uh, so wrong because when we see, let's go to the, this crowded, uh, when we see the this crowded uh, nuclei and the, this uh, architecture, we can uh, think that the adenocarcinoma metastasis, but with this at the very, very, very nice sclerotic border, I never seen such a, uh, malignant tumors with these uh, radiologic features. So when we close to, and go through the whole slice deeply, there is no marked atypia or mitosis was seen. So uh, the, this is the very, very uh, interesting cases. As I said, it's really open to discussion. After these challenging cases, I think it is again gloomy times. In anger and fury, be like that. Okay, let's continue with the case eight. 50 years old female patient, asymptomatic patient, and impacted tooth in the maxillary surrounded by a well defined predominantly radial central lesion. You can see here, again, we have one impacted tooth here, and then with the very sclerotic borders, radial sand, but with some radio opaque areas within this radial sense. I think this is also very, uh, with this age, with this appearance, uh, we have uh, some diagnosis in our minds. Yes, we can see here, uh, I think it's a straightforward cases again, uh, because uh, I think it is the only odontogenic lesions show the very distinct features, uh, which is not uh, distinguished with the other odontogenic tumors. Yes, we can see here, oops, we can see here very, very nice duct-like structure with the central lumen and the peripheral amyloblastic epithelium, again, reverse uh, polarization we can see here. And the, some solid aggregates with the uh, pool-like structure. Sometimes we can see amyloid-like material into the, in, in this uh, small lemon-like areas. And we have a very thick capsule around the uh, lesion. Uh, as I said, this is a, a very, it's a book pictures, uh, lesions, I think. Yes, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. I'm sure everybody get this uh, diagnosis easily. It is again, uh, just accounts to uh, lower than 5% of all odontogenic tumors. Enucleation is the treatment of choice and recurrence just due to the incomplete resection. Uh, for admitted odontogenic tumor, I really like this two-thirds rule. Two-thirds occur in females in the maxillary spawn with an impacted tooth. And impacted tooth are canines 
and show radioopaque flags of calcification in the radial sand lesion. Our cases show all these five rules in the one case, and usually we uh, really see these rules uh, for the adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. It's a very nice summary. Case nine, 29 years old female patient with expansive mixed radiolicent and radiopac lesion in the posterior maxillar site. We can see here, and the, uh, not too bad for the uh, sclerotic borders. We can see here, uh, the well defined, but here not so well, but we can see the borders. And again, one impact to, to here. And what can we have here? Yes, I like this malignant benign appearance. Well, this is the, of course, present atypical morphology here. We can see a polyhedral architecture with hyperchromatic and enlarged nuclear. Uh, really, if we don't know uh, where this biopsy was made, and if we don't know or aware of this antenna, we can easily say that this is the uh, malignant tumor. But this is really uh, present atypical. Uh, features. Yes, we have this appearance and the especially ring-like concentric basophilic classification, uh, sample Lisgang-like classification. It's very nice and uh, it's not unique to this uh, tumor, but we usually see such a classification. And amyloid material, which is a uh, congruate positive, but now we call this amyloid a uh, odontogenic amyloblast associated protein. It, it, it is again a kind of uh, amyloid, but we can say. So uh, with this amyloid uh, accumulation and this pseudo malignant uh, features and the ring lag uh, classification, our diagnosis would be classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. It's quite rare again, no gender predilection. Uh, any age with a predilection for the third to sixth decade of life with a mean age of 40. The mandible is the affected twice as often as the maxillar site and the surgical removal with torfury margin is important and uh, recurrence is about 15%. Case 10. A 39 years old male patient with mild swelling, mixed radiocent radiopec lesion in the anterior maxillary. This is also a very nice case, I think, uh, to make a brainstorm. And the clinical diagnosis was amyloblastic odontoma. You can see here, and the very uh, mixed, uh, maybe radioopac. Uh, areas much more uh, obvious than the radiocent uh, areas. And the one impacted tooth maybe uh, yes, just there. And we can see also uh, uh, impacted tooth here. And the uh, calcified mace we can see easily in the BT session. What we have? Here we have only very thick uh, capsule-like tissue around the uh, lesion. And when we closely look at, we can see just calcification areas, which is very comparing with the, it's very compatible with the radiologic features. Lots of calcifying areas with some small, some very large merged uh, calcification areas. There is no, uh, live cells to discuss here. So I just upload the two uh, blocks of these cases. Let's go to the next one. Now we have some uh, clue uh, for the diagnosis. Again, we can see a very, very large calcification for this uh, session again. And when we look at this, what we can see, just mentioned, uh, polyhedral cells, yes, we can see it here, with ring calcification. And it's very resembling the calcifying epithelial odontogenic like areas. Again, here, again, polyhedral cells. We have some clear cells, which we can see calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor again. But we have that like 
Arias too. It's a very nice duck like Arias. Or here, with it, some eosinophilic material inside it. Maybe it's amyloid, I don't know. Uh, but we can see nice duck like structure here. And so again, very nice. Uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor like areas. So how we call this lesion? It's cement, uh, uh, it is classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor with adenomatoid tumor, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor areas, or it's adenomatoid odontogenic tumor with geot like areas. Okay, we will call these adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. Uh, some authors recommended the designation of the combined epithelial odontogenic tumor and uh, give the diagnosis with the two uh, odontogenic tumor together in the diagnostic line. Uh, but actually, the current consensus is that classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor like areas are simply part of the histological spectrum of the adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. What did I did uh, for this case? I just give a adenomatoid odontogenic tumor uh, it, uh, in the diagnostic line with a note that uh, the tumor also contain a classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor-like areas. It's because we know that it's not uh, affected the biological behavior. Again, roomy time after this challenging case. In compassion and grace, be like sun. What important advice to humanity. Let's continue with the case 11. <coughs> 29 years old male patient, buccal and lingual expansion of the mandible, Pain similar to two tech. This is, I think, very important clinical feature for us. Similar to two tech, uh, we will discuss. Okay, this is also a very diagnostic feature for the radiologist. I think this is a very large radio opaque lesion and merge with the two truths. You can see a very a thin radio sat lesion around to this radio opaque lesion. I, I'm sure if you see this. Uh, radiology, uh, you would uh, say the diagnosis very easily for this from the whole slide imaging. Yes, this is a, this, these two pieces are the, uh, a little bit peripheral of the lesion, but this is the very diagnostic uh, features include it. Let's look at them. What we have here. Yes, this is a cementum cementum like tissue with prominent rest and reversal lines. Maybe here. Yeah, you can see rest and reversal lines here very well. And this basophilic uh, color is very characteristic for these lesions, <laughs> uh, basophilic uh, classification. And we can see very active uh, osteoblast uh, rubbing uh, around to uh, this heart tissue trabecule, and we can see accumulation of the osteoclast cells. We can call some call these the uh, osteoclast-like cells, but we can say I think cementoclast. We can see here, and the very uh, active lesion here with this active cementoblast and the, with these lines and. With this radiology especially, our diagnosis is cementoblastoma. And it's a, again quite rare odontogenic tumor uh, with a mean age of 20, no gender predilection. A characteristic feature is pain commonly described as sharp and similar, similar to TUTEC. So I say this is very important. The radiological appearance is almost always characteristic. 
and pathognomonic. So we have to see the radiology before giving uh, any intraosseous lesion diagnosis. Conservative treatment with the extraction of the affected tooth is the uh, choice and the recurrence just only after the uh, incomplete removal. But it's very close uh, significant resemblance to osteoblastoma, uh, but don't forget that osteoblastoma do not originate from the surface of the roots and do not attribute to it. This is very important differential diagnosis for the cementoblastoma cases. Number 12, uh, 65 years old male patients swelling in the mandibular body and multilocular radiolucency with relatively irregular margin, incisional biopsy was made, but you didn't see the incisional biopsy. This is the radiology of the uh, cases. You can see a very large across the midline with the some well-defined, but in many areas, we can't see the, any regular uh, borders and uh, it looks like a multilocular lesion. You didn't see this uh, macroscopic incisional biopsy. Uh, as you can see, the uh, cases, the radiologic appearance of the case is so large. Uh, the surgeon just sent a piece of uh, a piece of biopsy for the diagnosis. This is this biopsy is that. What we can see here, uh, we have a, again, yes, very obvious that cystic lying here and the cyst-like tissue and connective tissue here and the cyst lying here. When we look at the closely with the cystic lines, we can see some <coughs> macrocysts and mucus cells. But we have found a, this funny focus on the cyst wall. I'm sure everybody gets get, get thinking about the glandular odontogenic cyst now with this uh, very, very small piece, I know, but with this mucus cells and dark light structure, macrocyst, and this with a very large uh, destructive radiographic features. But for, after see this uh, areas, we want to give a descriptive diagnosis, which we said, Histopathological features suggest glandular odontogenic cysts. However, low-grade introduces mucopidermoid carcinoma could not exclude exactly. Uh, after this report, the surgeon called us and uh, they said they prefer to do re biopsies and uh, they made uh, the uh, yeah. retired biopsy and submit us. You see these slides in your uh, workshop. What we have now, yes, just I want to open my analysis. Okay, again, we have very similar areas in the incisional biopsy, which is a different uh, thickness of the epithelial lying with the very, very prominent mu mu mucous cells we can see here. And again, we have macrocyst here, very obvious, and very well formed glands or the duct -like structure we can see here. Again, a focus on the cyst wall. Uh, of course, we can see the daughter cyst in glandular odontogenic cyst, but this a little bit goes differently. And if you catch these areas, these three cell types, what are there? Intermediate cells you can see here, and scomoid cells, you can see epidermoid cells, and of course, very, very uh, large areas of the mucous cells. So another side, it's a very nice example of the three type of the cells, mucous, intermediate, and scomoid cells. Also, we have some clear cells in the other sides. And if you go to the, this is the same cases, but if you go to the, this side, because these uh, blocks, they calcified, so uh, they are not uh, together. If we go these sides, you can see very, very clear bone infiltration here with this uh, funny uh, epithelial lying. Again, here, it's very obvious. So uh, even if this workshop name is odontogenic uh, cysts and tumors, this uh, case diagnosis was intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma. 
It's usually occur middle age adults, a slight female predilection, more common in the mandibular side, and the uh, radical surgical resection is the main uh, treatment. But of course, it depends on the uh, it's uh, great, but this one is low grade with a large cystic areas, and the prognosis, if it is low grade, it's good. I have a bonus case here, just to compare with the uh, introsus mucadermoid carcinoma with the glandular odontogenic, odontogenic cysts. It's 28 years old female patient, painless swelling in the anterior mandible. Now we can see here, and again, it's a, a large lesion, as we see the previous case, but this time the borders is very well defined comparing with the first one, and the sclerotic border, uh, and this one also uh, cross the midline. Glandular odontogenic tumor really likes to uh, cross the midline. Yes, what we have. Now again, we have microcyst here in the epithelial lying. Again, we have duct-like uh, gland uh, structures. We have columnar cells uh, the, at the uh, luminal surface at the epithelial lying, upper epithelial lying. Of course, we have mucous cells and with these columnar cells, which the nuclei are uh, replaced at the base of the uh, membrane. And we can see some uh, spheric plaques into the wall or into the limon. We can see all these features. And if we made PAA staining, we can see that all these mucous cells are uh, reacted to this stain. And this is glandular odontogenic cyst. It's a quite rare odontogenic cyst. It is not enough to see a few uh, mucous cells or uh, just a one or two duct like structure in the epithelium. There is a really uh, important 10 diagnostic criteria, and at least you have to see seven of the, these 10 criteria to give glandular odontogenic keratosis diagnosis. It's a white uh, patient age range and no gender predilection. And uh, again, as uh, odontogenic keratosis, this is also very high recurrence rate. It's about 30 to 50 percent. And sometimes, because of this, uh, because of the size of the lesion and the uh, multiple recurrence, uh, the surgeon uh, tend to prefer the resection for this uh, rare odontogenic cyst. Okay, how we, uh, let's summarize the uh, histopathology of the glandular odontogenic tumor. We have, as I said, WHO classification mentioned 10 different histopathological criteria. One, of course, we have to see the uh, cystic lion, cystic squamous epithelium. And uh, especially the, the luminal layer of the low columnar cell, sometimes referred to as hobnail cells, uh, present at least focally. Uh, and the other criteria is intraepithelial microcyst, apocrine metaplasia, clear cells, uh, to think, as I uh, showed you, uh, popular projections or plaque like. Uh, areas into the lumen and mucus cell. As you can see, this mucus cell is not enough for the glandular odontogenic cyst. Sometimes uh, I get some consultation uh, with just a few mucus cells and that like structure, is this a uh, glandular odontogenic uh, cyst? Yeah, no, it's not. And other uh, three uh, important criteria, uh, especially, yes, like we said, epithelial sphere is similar to those uh, seen in lateral periodontal cyst, and we can see cilia time to time, and multiple cystic compartments uh, like the other keys, we can see uh, sometimes. How can we uh, differentiate its mucoepidermid carcinoma? We have to say that it is impossible to distinguish it from intraestrous mucoepidermid carcinoma in a small biopsy, in an incisional biopsy. Immunohemistic chemistry is not useful uh, but some, uh, I just read a paper about the CK18, uh, and uh, the author say that CK18 is a very good uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, which is 
100% positivity in the intraosseous mucopidermid carcinomata, but very low percentage, it's about 15, I think, uh, percentage positivity in the glandular odontogenic carcinoma, but I have no experience with this immunosecondary. What are the most important histological uh, features? If we see solid islets with three cell types in the cis wall, this is very important. Bone infiltration, obvious bone infiltration is very important. And of course, if we have a chance, we have to do mammal 2 gene rearrangement. This is the distinct uh, aid for the differential diagnosis. This case also uh, got the mammal 2 gene arrangement, which I saw you, our case. All these three uh, features strongly uh, support the introsis mucoectomid carcinoma comparing with the glandular odontogenic carcinoma. After this very challenging case, I think it's again a little bit relaxing time. In anger and fury, we like that. Okay, case 13. 18 years old female patient, painless, slowly growing mass, well defined unilocular radiolucendi in the mandibular body. We will see the radiology here. You can see here in the large cyclotic radiolucent lesion. Uh, again, a uh, move. Uh, movement of the roots, but no, there is no distinct uh, resorption in the two roots. Uh, again, this is for, it's a straightforward cases, uh, I believe. Uh, when we look at the features, you can see a very, very nice form of uh, amyloblastic epithelial islands. It's very obvious, this reverse polarity, hyperchromatism and the palisading, uh, palisading of the basal layer and uh, all this epithelial island uh, resembling its amyloblastic. And sometimes we can see the epithelial islands like a long stand of odontogenic epithelium showing a bilayer of amyloblastic looking cells. Uh, the age yeah, here the age becomes stagnant and rounded, uh, imparting a so-called drumstick appearance. You can see a very nice uh, drumstick appearance here. And uh, if we look at the stroma, we can see richly cellular stroma of loose, uh, primitive fearing connective tissue resembling dental papilla. All these uh, sores are very, very uh, similar to each other. Uh, so uh, I think everybody get the uh, diagnosis very easily. Uh, yes, this is absolutely amyloblastic fibroma. Uh, most frequently in the first two deca decades, uh, the slight male predilection and more than uh, 20, uh, 80 cases uh, in the posterior mandible. Uh, treatment choice I variable. Uh, it depends on the age, size, localization, but most commonly conservative therapy for small and asymptomatic lesions. Uh, less commonly aggressive surgery uh, were made, uh, uh, is made. The recurrence rate about due to the incomplete resection is about uh, 20%. And rarely transform the amyloblastic fibroma sarcoma when untreated or more commonly following multiple local recurrence of the benign amyloblastic fibroma. So it's uh, uh, very important for this. It's not uh, quite common. Amyloblastic fibroma is quite rare, and also the transforming to amyloblastic sarcoma is much more rare. So, uh, but uh, it can be. So, the long term follow up is necessary to de detect recurrence and possible malignant transformation. Case 14 five years old male patient, pain and swelling a radiocent lesion with cyclotic border in the posterior mandible. I am again really wondering what did you think for this lesion? This is a very, very controversial topic. 
We can see here uh, the large sclerotic mass. Uh, radiolucent, uh, in the radiolucent areas, we can see nice radio opaque. Uh, some is very close to the crown of this uh, crown, uh, close to crown. Uh, and when we look at the uh, histopathological slides, we can see some islands which we mentioned amyloblastic fibroma here. You can see here, here here. When we look at closely them, again, amyloblastic epithelium here and here. When we look this piece, we can see very nice dentinoid material and animal material we can see here. And again, very nice uh, animal epithelium here. And when we go to these sites, we can see again dentinoid like material and also uh, amyloblast, odontoblast. We can see all the structure uh, of the tooth, uh, and, but with the very nice dental papillae like areas. So the question is arises this is the developing odontoma or amyloblastic fibrodontoma? Yes, uh, this debate never ends. But who says uh, developing odontoma? Who says developing odontoma? Uh, amyloblastic fibrodontoma, as we said, uh, and the fibrodontoma and uh, fibrodentinoma were excluded from the study. But uh, if you ask me for my opinion for these cases, with this, uh, if this is developing odontoma with this radiology, when it's developed, how, how became how became the size of the lesions? So I believe that the, these lesions, uh, amyloblastic uh, fibroodontoma cases, but uh, we have a, a very nice dis discussion was uh, held in London uh, in last June, but uh, again, this Congress was canceled uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, and now we are pl planning to uh, have this Congress in the next uh, June 2021, uh, if everything goes well, of course. Uh, at this IOP debate, we discussed, uh, we, uh, we had discussed, uh, we would discuss, really, uh, amyloblastic fibrodontoma is a neoplasm or not. Uh, you can see here, uh, yeah, I'm really uh, brave or crazy to uh, speak against uh, John Wright because uh, he, he will talk about it's a, a hamartoma, but I will talk about uh, it's a neoplasm. Yeah, it seems crazy, really. But I'm sure uh, I, I have said some crazy plan for the Dr. White. I can speak uh, bravely here because uh, he's sleeping in Texas now. Don't uh, catch this. Uh, don't miss this uh, excellent Congress, please. Case 15. 90 years old male patients, again, uh, we catch it routine radiographic examination. You can see here were a large mass, radio opaque mass with uh, the uh, cause to this tooth impact. Uh, so uh, you can see some small structure maybe resembling the, some immature tooth, we can say this. When we look at these sites, it's a little bit different from the first one, uh, previous one, sorry, previous one. We can see a very nice animal or uh, animal here. Of course, after the classification, uh, usually uh, we don't see this, but this case is very nice to see the animal organ. Yes, we can see that uh, such an immature tooth here. Another immature tooth we can see here and the here and the here and the small structures. Uh, if you, go, let's go to the, my patients. Yes, animal and dentin size. Sometimes we can see at the soft tissue capsule, odontogenic epithelium islands you can see here. Sometimes we, can, we can see ghost cell, but these are not diagnosed for the odontoma, but we can see time to time. And of course, we can see some classifications, but uh, these uh, last three uh, features is not uh, the diagnostic features for the odontoma cases. Yes, 
This is the most common odontogenic tumor if we say this is not a hamartoma. Uh, and the first and second decade is the most occurring uh, age predilection. Uh, compound odontomas usually occur in the anterior maxillary site and the complex odontomas tend to occur in the, in the posterior mandible, uh, frequently around it and erupted to it. Uh, conservative surgery is the treatment of the uh, treatment for the odontoma cases and the recurrence due to the only incomplete removal. It is so obvious that yes, I also accept that uh, there is a really uh, similar histological uh, appearance between these all these two three entities. Uh, the histological similarity between these uh, features, uh, lesions, and feature studies are necessary to make the distinctions clearly. Each case should be evaluated within itself and with all its clinical features, because I also uh, saw some uh, ameloblastic fibroodontoma cases, which is really not ameloblastic fibroodontoma, it's odontoma. So uh, we have to make, uh, with this clinic, for my case, I'm, I'm uh, speaking for my uh, clinic, uh, for my cases, with these radiological features and such swelling, I think it's a ameloblastic fibroodontoma cases. Uh, but uh, this debate never ends in this workshop, and we will be taking you the uh, AOP Congress next year. After this challenging uh, cases, again, roomy time. generosity and helping others be like a river. Case 16. 45 years old female patient, pain, ulceration, swelling, right Okay. Problem. Yes, it seems that we don't have Merva yet. So, Professor Olgoch, is there anything you want to add to the presentation? Yeah, I'm waiting for the last, uh, but uh, there's so many uh, goodwill uh, message, and uh, they our colleague, colleagues sent their, their diagnosis, and most of them true. And uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry. It seems that she's back. Yes, please, Professor, you can continue. Yes. Uh, Kate Hunter sent a message for the uh, amyloblastic odonto, uh, fibroodontoma. Uh, I am with you. The, he said, I am with you, Marwa, the, in these cases. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, it's going very well, but uh, there's a technical problem. Uh, maybe uh, Mara will solve this uh, problem. I'm coming back. Possible oh, and yes. come back. Hello again. Come back. Okay. Okay. I think because of the, uh, I'm making my presentation uh, from the another online website. It's not a PowerPoint presentation. It's not a keynote. It's from the live uh, online presentation. So I think there's a sometimes problem we can see, but now I'm here again. Okay, let's continue with the, our cases. Okay. Just be there. Just I'm waiting to uh, uploading all the cases for not uh, uh, upload again. Here we are. 
Yes. Okay, what we have in radiologically, we can see very, very irregular borders with the radial scintillation you can see here. And uh, sorry for these, the dark sites, but now I want to just show my uh, annotations here. If you catch this cystic lion under the squamous, after under the this cystic lion, you can see some funny squamous island here, but this is so obvious that this is a cystic lion. In other sites, we can see the cystic lion. I, I'm not sure for this, the component of the tumor or uh, originated from the uh, odontogenic epithelium, but it's, uh, that one is very obvious, uh, odontogenic epithelial lying. Yes, we have very, very uh, large uh, abundant keratinization and some small squamous nets, it's no doubt that these are our atypical squamous epithelium. You can see here, one is the, uh, some small islands or single cells we can see with the pleomorphism. So, uh, no doubt that this is the malignant uh, tumor, uh, but well, how can we call this one? With the radiologic feature and this atypical uh, cytological feature, this is a malignant tumor. We can see here very, very nice. Uh, of course, this uh, case has other blocks, uh, which we see the uh, odontogenic uh, lying uh, very well from this uh, Slides, but I want to uh, make you a little bit complex to get this diagnosis. So primary intraosseous carcinoma was our diagnosis. Uh, it's really occur uh, rarely and uh, with a wide age range with a mean age at the diagnosis of uh, 55 or 60 years. Frequently in the occurs and posterior region of the mandible and the maxillary cases prefer to occur in the anterior regions. And radicular resection with neck resection, uh, net dissection is the treatment of the choi, uh, choice and the um, prognosis is usually poor. But we have to know that maybe not for my cases because it's so obvious that it's arising from the odontogenic cyst. Uh, we can call it odontogenic keratosis or orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst. I'm not sure, but keratinized odontogenic cyst. But uh, other cases, we have to evaluate histological, radiological, and the clinical information needs to exclude especially metastasis, which is much more common than the primary intraosseous carcinomas. Malignant odontogenic tumor of specific types, carcinomas of the maxillary antrum and nasal mucosa, and intraosseous salivary gland neoplasm. Uh, we can do some immunostatic chemistry, maybe, but not my cases. But if we do, just the uh, negative CK and indicates that then, uh, an odontogenic epithelial origin is unlikely. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, for the odontogenic tumors, uh, all odontogenic lesions, there is not a very useful immunostatic chemistry studies. Let's continue with the case. 17. 55 years old male patient, pain swelling, and we can see lesion here. Again, uh, this is a very controversial uh, lesion if you go through it in the workshop before the, uh, my presentation. You can see the first 2012 biopsy. You saw the 2018 biopsy in your link. So this is the uh, also radiography of the 2012. This is, my, uh, this is a consultation case to me. I haven't got the, these uh, slides for the incisional biopsy for the whole slide imaging. So I just show you uh, some uh, pictures of the, this uh, incisional biopsy. Uh, but, sorry, it's not incisional. This is the enucleation. Uh, biopsy. You can see here the um, irregular borders with the, some root resorption here. And maybe this is flattening tooth, maybe we can see here, but it's obvious that it's a not, not nice one. Okay. 
Yes, this is what we see. It's a very dense cyclotic stroma with some small uh, islands of the uh, epithelial uh, cells. Uh, two types we can see. One is the dark nuclear and the small ones, and the other is a large, a larger uh, cytoplasmic with the clear to uh, pale uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm. And when we look at this one, uh, yes, it's very uh, obvious this has clear cells with the surrounding the uh, another basal layer you can see here. And the some uh, primitive odontogenic epithelial island here we can see. But in the out center, this uh, biopsy was diagnosed as an amyloblastic tumor. Uh, after the enucleation in 2012, uh, these pictures, 2014, uh, the pathologic fractures uh, made, uh, but I haven't, I couldn't find this uh, pathological slides for this case. After this, again, the, uh, another uh, resection made, and this is the 2017, you can see a very nice healing. Now, 2018, it's again uh, recurred with these uh, multiple uh, radiolucent areas. This case was consulted to me and you uh, see this one. This is very important why we know the history of the cases. Because if you get these sites, you can see the saliva gland tissue. And it is so normal, you think that maybe it is another uh, intraosseous salivary gland lesion, especially the uh, helenizing uh, clear cell uh, salivary gland tumors. Yes, but this is just about the uh, patient's reconstruction and the other resection sites. A lingual or mandibular salivary gland just removed and catch, uh, came to do these uh, slides. Uh, we have lots of uh, blocks for this case. Just on the one we have the, this the uh, salivary gland tissue. Just I really want to uh, discuss this tumor and the importance of the history. So I made a little bit confusing this case for you. Uh, when we look at the, these cells again, it's very very similar to the. 2012 biopsies, but at, at, uh, in the 2012 biopsies, we see some nice uh, odontogenic epithelial islands uh, with uh, some clear cells. Uh, and uh, we can see again, not so much clear cells, but again, pale uh, esnophilic pale cells with the dark and other uh, groups of dark cells. Yes, we can see here a, a little bit more clear cells, I think just there. Yes, you can see a little bit more clearer cells here. So with this history and uh, with the, the first uh, cases who slightly imaging, we called this one odontogenic clear cell carcinoma. It's a very difficult uh, diagnosis actually. Uh, you all know that this is also very similar uh, features including molecular features with the uh, salivary gland uh, clear cell carcinoma. So this, this is a very important uh, to know the history. Nearly 100 well characterized cases in the literatures, more common in female, and the, the main patient is uh, 53 years old, uh, and mandible a mandible effect is much more than maxillary and especially the posterior body. Complete surgical resection and radiotherapy may also be considered. The outcome uh, has been that in the 50% of all cases with a median uh, survival rate, uh, survival year, 14 years. Recurrence and metastasis may develop after many years as seen our cases. So differential diagnosis is bored for the clear cell. This is obvious. Uh, especially, I did know that the feature is distinctive, but not pathognomonic. So exclusion of the other clear cell rich neoplasm, rich, uh, uh, clear cell rich neoplasms uh, should be made. 
Uh, in the 2012 um, biopsies, I got the uh, report of that pathologies. They made lots of uh, immunohistochemistry, but no significant uh, or no um, different immunohistochemistry positivity to make uh, their road. Uh, so we have to exclude especially salivary gland neoplasm, melanoma, and metastatic renal cell carcinoma. For metastatic renal cell carcinoma, I like PAX, PAX8 uh, to distinguish it uh, from the renal origin. Uh, another differential diagnosis, amyloblastoma with clear cell differentiation and clear cell calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. Uh, these tumors also uh, include some clear cells in their inside, but clear cell change in this lesion is usually focal and normally uh, do not uh, tie ties to get to make the diagnosis. Case 18. We are almost done with the whole workshop. Uh, 61 years old male, trismus, pain and the swelling large radial sand lesion of the posterior mandible with soft tissue extension. You can see here the very, very severe trismus for this patient. The surgeon made a really difficult biopsy from this side, so you can see the surface epithelium on the slides. Uh, this is very obvious that this is a malignant uh, tumor with a uh, radial sand lesion, irregular borders, and with the large soft tissue extension. You can see at the BT and the, the bolt plate of the mandible destructed by the tumor. You can see a very large mess. What can we see here? Okay. Uh, for this case, uh, we have to catch the we have to catch the uh, amyloblastic differentiation. Uh, these areas, for example, cytological features of malignancy and histopathological pattern of amyloblastoma, you can see. It's not so obvious, but we have to uh, get this amyloblastic uh, differentiation from this, uh, from this, this scanned slide. So another nice, uh, it's, it, resembling the amyloblastic epithelium here, maybe squamous differentiation here, but we have some uh, bizarre cells inside it. Maybe we can see a reverse polarity and hyperchromatism, at least at, at focale. And, but it's so obvious that this lesion includes really bizarre atypical cells. But this is a very nice, again, amyloblastic features, uh, just give that we are looking for the odontogenic origin malignancy. Uh, for this case, there is no doubt that uh, the epithelial component is malignant. But I want to take your attention to the stromal cells. Did you see these stromal cells? Or did you see the spindle, a little bit spindle uh, stromal cells? I have no idea what I did. Uh, so if the uh, we can say that if the stromal cells is malignant, we can call this carcinosarcoma because as you know that carcinosarcoma, both epithelial and the mesenchymal uh, structure are malignant. We have a very nice uh, visa cells for the epithelial uh, sites and the stromal cells, we can see some malignant features. Okay, what did we call? We call this amyloblastic carcinoma with a note that I will explain. Uh, amyloblastic carcinoma occur in the uh, elderly uh, age. A posterior mandible is the predilection and the swelling, pain, ulceration, prosthesia, trismus, all these are the non specific uh, features of the malignant tumors. Uh, the main treatment is radical surgical resection. Uh, prognosis is quite poor and lung metastasis develops much more commonly than the local lesional lymph node metastasis. And recurrence, 28% uh, with resection 
and the uh, not this case, but sometimes uh, the conservative uh, removal uh, can be uh, made for the initial, but the diagnosis followed by this. So 92% uh, for the conventional removal for amyloblastic carcinoma, the, but the, pro, the overall prognosis is quite poor. Uh, for the, this sarcomatoid areas in our pictures, this picture is also from the other blocks of our cases. The last edition said that amyloblastic carcinoma associated with the malignant spindle cell proliferation is best characterized as sarcomatoid amyloblastic carcinoma rather than true odontogenic carcinoma sarcoma. I just write this to my uh, note uh, in my report. Okay, the last case of the workshop. It's the 19, the number of 19 case. I call this a zebra case. It's a very, very fabulous case, I think. Uh, 41 years old male patient, large expansive radiocent lesion of the ramus and the corpus sites. You can see here very large lesion here with radiocent uh, and the expansion we can see here. And what we have, I just want to open my annotations because lots of features here. What we have, we have keratinized epithelium, uh, but not very obvious palisading li lying. We have classification just under the, some classifications under the epithelium. Lots of lamellar keratin in the lumen. We have daughter cysts. We have such funny differentiation. I don't know how, call, how we call this one. We can see amyloblastic differentiation, arctic drum stick, which we also uh, mentioned in the other cases. I want to continue with the, this case also two slides for your evaluation. Just I want to go to next one. These are all same cases what we have here, this epithelial bulbing, it's, you can see really different differentiation. We can see such squamous island in the epithelium, you can see. Maybe we see corrugated palisading epithelium, not obvious palisading at the basal layer, but maybe it's some features of the keratinized odontogenic cyst and we can see such a lining epithelium. So, firstly, it looks odontogenic. I, I'm sure we all agree, but uh, divergent patterns of differentiation. In some areas, there are odontogenic keratosis like features. In other, amyloblastomous differentiation, elsewhere, mixture of both. And the classification in the wall is curious. This has been reported in the kerato amyloblastoma. And uh, also, I, I, if you ask me, uh, what is my diagnosis? My diagnosis, I don't know the diagnosis, the exact diagnosis for this one. We just write the amyloblastic differentiation within a development of odontogenic cyst with a note that long-term close follow-up is required for the possible recurrence. We just write this. Uh, but I think maybe we call this uh, unique odontogenic lesions is Polymorphous odontogenic cysts, I don't know. Uh, the polymorphous odontogenic cyst also was uh, described in 1996, I think. Uh, but some areas really look like at that case, uh, but I don't know. I think uh, the next classification waiting for this uh, unique lesion. Okay, let's finish my workshop with the uh, nice traditional Sufi music and the Rumi's last, last advice to whole humanity. In concealing other faults, be like night. Thanks for your kind attention for two hours.
Yes, that's great, Marwa. I, as I, uh, as I, as I expected. Uh, thank you. There's so many uh, goodwill message and uh, thanks and <laughs> your cases uh, been liked for, for nearly everybody. Uh, there's a, a message from Kate Hunter uh, about the odontogenic uh, amyloblastic odontofibroma cases. Uh, I'm uh, agree with you. Uh, he said for these cases. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Keith. Yes. Uh, and the, uh, yes, I, I'm thankful to Dr. Eladdini. Uh, they, uh, she, he, uh, with the uh, questions uh, and uh, sent me from uh, WhatsApp, and I will pass you some of them because we have a limited time. Uh, but before then. Uh, we are, I can uh, say we are lucky today because we have a uh, very, very special and uh, important guest uh, today. Dr. Slotvek is uh, with us. Uh, dear professor, may, may I kindly invite you, give your comments and contribution about this uh, perform and this subject? Yes, uh, of course, I'm most happy to give some comments, but the first comment would be to congratulate you, Dr. Tekesi, with a very nice overview of the autogenic lesions, new things, and old problems that you combined in a superb presentation of, uh, of cases, all covering almost anything and also already covering something that I had like to cover in the present, next presentation. So I have to see how that will uh, come out. But anyhow, yeah, in fact, you, you have uh, addressed quite, quite a couple of, of things. Uh, the, the differential diagnosis of the odontogenic keratocyst, the problem in making the diagnosis in cystic lesions when they are inflamed because inflammation will make uh, the uh, initial original uh, appearance almost unrecognizable. But I think that my, my main point, a point that you already addressed, is the relationship between the odontoma and its precursor stages. Uh, the are we, do we have, are we dealing with different lesions, a neoblastic fibro odontoma, developing odontoma, is that are they just stages in a, in a row, or are they lesions that, that deserve a separate classification? And that's the, and in that case, there are not, it's not so much new, because that was already the subject of my PhD thesis 40 years ago. So it seems that in, within 40 years, we not yet have been able to solve that point. And I, uh, and let's say my opinion, I think I, I'm a, I'm a, a lumber. I, and that was also the, the policy of the uh, WHO uh, editorial team that we should not make distinctions that are not uh, evidence-based. So if we don't have clear evidence that lesions are entirely different, we should uh, not make different categories just to, to make it easy for the pathologists to make a, yeah, to arrive at the appropriate diagnosis. And uh, that's why we made a choice for the, uh, to, to, to lump them. Because I think we all agree that even a, uh, uh, an odontoma somewhere in its development has shown the appearance of an amyloblastic fibrodentinoma or amyloblastic fibrodentinoma. It's just a question of de developing odontogenic tissues. And, um, and uh, we all 
in our consultation practice had seen so many cases in which you see at one side more immature areas and in another area more mature parts and then comparing them with the developing tooth germ we thought it would be the most appropriate way to consider them all in one group and just different stages of development and I think that your case number 14 that I found very interesting in fact illustrates that because when I was looking at that case I just saw a quite a lot of tiny structures resembling two germs in a fibrous stroma. So for me, I would diagnose the case as a unique example of a developing compound odontoma. Just quite a lot of immature two germs because quite a lot of them show the arrangement of a tiny tooth, a center, a shell of dentine with an outer shell of enamel. So in fact, the case that you would prefer to diagnose as a, as a myoblastic fibroodontoma is for me a prime example of a developing compound odontoma. So just illustrating that it's wiser to lump those cases than to split them. That's, I think, my main comment. And that's, but besides that, I think we will never be for sure. But just from a practical point of view, I think it's better not to split. So far. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, uh, your, for your uh, valuable contributions. Now we get the questions. Uh, I will pass you the easy one, uh, Marwa, because we are the same thing. Uh, there's no so hard questions. Uh, some of them is Daniel. Uh, eruption kist was adapted into the dentigerous kist as an extraosseous variant of dentigerous kist in 19, uh, in uh, 2017 uh, classifications of who? Not a separate entity. Please clarify, he said. Yes, uh, it's not a separate and it's just it's not a separate title we can say. But under the dentigerous cyst, uh, the soft tissue counterpoint name was eruptosis and it's sharing with the similar histopathological features and just the counterpart of the uh, dentigerous cyst. Con uh, soft tissue counterpart of the dentigeresis. So the double H hole classification do not exclude the eruption cysts. Just uh, not uh, just mentioned in the under the odontogenic uh, under the dentigeresis. It's not excluded from the study from the I'm, classification. I'm uh, be hurry because we have so limited time. Uh, Doctor Moni Ahmadian. Uh, sometimes we see the combined orthokeratinocyte odontogenic cyst and odontogenic keratosis. Does new classification of who makes any comment how to classify the cyst? I think it's an odontogenic uh, cyst. So, 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 sorry, for, I can't hear it clearly for the beginning of the question. Sometimes we see combined ortho, uh, we see combined orthokeratinocyte odontogenic cyst and odontogenic keratosis. Uh, okay, if we see parakeratinized epithelium in the large areas with the focus of orthokeratinized cyst, we called this cyst odontogenic keratosis because its behavior like odontogenic keratosis, not orthokeratinized. Uh, because orthokeratinized epithelium we can see in the odontogenic keratosis time to time, but it's not uh, uh, necessary uh, to see the whole epithelium orthokeratinized. So, so we should call it uh, if the clear palisating with the clear palisating corrugated par parakeratinized epithelial lying we have, uh, we should call that cis odontogenic keratosis due to the different biological behavior. Um, from uh, Dr. Mugundan uh, from Chennai, does the histological subtype of amenoblastoma influence the treatment? Uh, histological uh, types 
do not include, uh, do not affect the, uh, actually, the histological type of the amyloblastoma do not affect the uh, treatment choice of the amyloblastoma, especially for the amyloblastic treatment. Of course, unicystic is different. Just I'm talking about the uh, histological subtypes. Uh, the follicular acanthomatous, basaloid, or other plexiform, they are not a different uh, clinical behavior we know until now. Uh, but uh, for the unicystic one, of course, uh, I am exacting from the moral type, the enucleation is a treatment of choice, and the peripheral amyloblastoma is a basic a conservative uh, local excision. But others amyloblastomes, all types, uh, really aggressive infiltration. And most of them, I think, uh, of course, it depends on the size, but uh, needs to uh, large envelope resection or segmental resection sometimes. Yes. Uh, from uh, Johan Opperman. Uh, I think about uh, this question is about uh, amyloblastoma, the second case is plexiform one. Uh, uh, did you uh, do PRAF V100 e, uh, e immunochemistry? I can answer it, no, we didn't. <laughs> yes. uh, because we haven't got this immun immunohistochemistry in our department, but uh, I don't, uh, maybe I, I, I showed to do the other, uh, how can I say this? This is the incisional biopsy, which you evaluate and which I see here. After this uh, incisional bio biopsy and diagnosis, the whole specimen submitted to us, and there is really classical amyloblastic uh, features we can see there, uh, but we didn't see any rough uh, V600 uh, uh, immunostochemistry. Yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't got it. From Iman Helmi, uh, when we could use the term of hybrid odontogenic tumor? Uh, actually, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, I don't use, I always say the, which one is the prominent. Which one is the prominent feature? I call that odontogenic tumor, just mentioned other small parts as I did not uh, that to the surgeon. And I which one is worst? Yeah, 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 yes, of course. So that's a kind reminder that we have less than five minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, some question maybe will not be answered, but we turn the participants, our participants, with email or any other any way. Uh, it will be suitable. Uh, I will leave you uh, the, with my best regards uh, to the other uh, sections. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you very much for uh, our actively uh, active participants, and uh, your organization is very well. And, and uh, I'm saying goodbye all of you from Istanbul. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, dear Merva and Professor Sluthbeck for being here today with us. So uh, on behalf of the organization team, I would like to present the certificates to the Professor Dr. Algoch and dear Professor Merva for their outstanding contribution to this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here uh, and joining us today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I thank you very much. It's your big pleasure. Stay healthy, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, you, Dr. Olgoch and Merva, again for uh, your time uh, that you spent. I know that it, spent too, uh, it takes too much time for Merva to uh, select the cases, and they were selected so carefully to scan the slides, upload them, and we have many uh, you know, meetings in order to design the panel. So, and I saw in your presentation that you highlighted the hallmarks uh, of each case. So thank you very much for your attention to the details. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be back in five minutes for the next panel. So please stay with us. We will be in five minutes back for the bone pathology tumor panel. Thank you.
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second panel of the fifth Congress of Iranian Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologist Association. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, introduce my colleague from Iran as moderator of this panel on bone pathology, Dr. Tina Shushtarizadeh. Uh, she's uh, from Iran University of Medical Sciences, uh, associate professor of the university, and she'll, she's well experienced in bone pathology in Iran. Dr. Shushtarizadeh, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaki. Um, I'm Dr. Shushtarizadeh, and my career um, is mainly on bone and soft tissue pathology. And I'm so excited today to uh, be here and uh, have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Uh, Slutbeck, our dear speaker guest, and um, as you know, he is a retired professor of pathology, Radbao University, Nachman Medical Center. He is author of many books and original papers. And uh, we are going to have a talk with him on diseases of the jaw bones. And the main question of this field, uh, which all we know that is, is something reactive or neoplastic? And this is the main question. Are they all neoplastic, the jaw lesions? And um, as you know, it is a main 
uh, topic of challenge in many cases. And we uh, are so interested to hear your lecture, dear doctor, and um, please start. Yes, let's, uh, let's start. First, I would like, like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Initially, it had, it, I should have been in Iran last uh, February, but that couldn't uh, be done because of the uh, difficult circumstances that they have to face now. So it's my pleasure that we can do it now in this way. And uh, of course, thanks a lot for anybody to anybody who has uh, made this possible. And hope I hope that I will meet the expectations um, in the next, uh, yeah, let's say uh, 60 minutes. And my topic, as already told, will be on jawbone pathology. That maybe there will uh, will be a little uh, bit uh, overlap with. Uh, things that already have been addressed by the previous speaker, because uh, yeah, bone, jawbone pathology also includes autogenic pathology, but I think uh, the overlap is rather limited, so it will not be too disturbing. So now see if the technique from my side will give us what we would like to see, and that's indeed So this is my first slide, the slide that just uh, serves to introduce the talk, the talk about the bone pathology, uh, bone pathology, jaw pathology, with, uh, of course, the autogenic lesions uh, left out. This, uh, this is uh, when we are speaking, when we are speaking about bone pathology in, the, in general, but in particular for the jaw, we have to start by making a gross, a gross classification in bone producing those that make cartilage, the fibrosis in which we have a mixture of fibrous tissue and bone, the giant cell lesions, and the mixoid lesions. And that's of course not too, uh, too difficult. And for my, uh, my current presentation, that will be mainly be, be devoted to bone producing fiber osseous and giant cell cartilages that will be left out because they are very rare in the jaw. Maybe at the end, if we have some time left, I can say a few words a few words on that. Let, let me start with bone forming lesions. We have of course the quite common exostosis, we have the osteoma, osteoblastoma, osteosarcoma, and I think we, anybody who is familiar with the oral cavity will recognize this, of course not always so excessive, so huge, but these are the so-called exostosis, the tori, that can be seen at the lingual side of the mandible or at the buccal side of the upper jaw as the most common lesions. They will, of course, they do not require any treatment unless they interfere with dental prosthesis. In that case, there is an indication to do some recontouring of the jaw. Here you see the, how they look like in a dry specimen. You can see it's local, they are local bony thickenings, bony thickenings that are composed of compact, compact lamellar bone. Lamellar bone, here you see the periodontal ligament, here you see the surface of a tooth, and you can see here the bone of the alveolar socket. And here you see how that the dental socket shows considerable thickening at the surface, being the histology of the torus, the exostosis, 
and of course that will not make much uh, diagnostic problems but, but why i'm showing is the reason i'm showing it is that quite often biopsies taken from jawbone lesions are taken too superficial not providing our us with a real lesion that is more deeply seated and then in those cases you will have in your slides only uh, the cortical surface the cortical bone and if you have if that's all you have you may can be make can make a diagnosis of a uh, yeah an exostosis a torus a bone lesion missing the real lesion because the, that has not been biopsied by the surgeon and of course this picture of the osteoma is also of the torus is also shown by osteomas osteomas that we see quite more often in the upper jaw in the lower jaw because they are mainly sinonasal lesions and not real jaw lesions so far about the simple reactive cortical bone lesions not being uh, not being uh, real tumors of course that does not apply for the tumor that now asks my attention the osteoblastoma osteoblastoma already briefly addressed by uh, the previous speaker is mostly is in the head and neck region mostly seen in the vertebral column in the cervical vertebrae but may sometimes involve the jaw as well and here you see such an example here you see a rather small lesion small lesion with a central cortical a central radial dense uh, spot and here you see a much larger area much larger lesion lesion in which there's also much more bone formation and here you can see the corresponding histology you see a area of osteoid osteoid with mineralization irregular mineralization here you see at the periphery the so-called uh, spiculae radiating a kind of a fringe covered with hypertrophic oste hyperplastic osteoblasts large you can have even some mitotic features incidentally and i think that you can understand why sometimes osteoblastomas are mistaken for osteosarcomas because of their cellularity but on close examination you can see that although there are mitotic figures the cells themselves the nuclei are large but is not very not much polymorphism nuclei are large cells and the cells are also large so there is no disturbance of the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio which would be present in a malignancy and of course osteoblastoma in the jaw has to be distinguished from the cementoblastoma the real odontogenic tumor and here you see such a cementoblastoma here you see a radio dense lesion that's connected with the partly resorbed root of this molar tooth and this of course as already has been told rather diagnostic root resorption together with a uh, radio park mass that are intimately connected with each other and here you see another example here again a kind of a, a radiolucent rim here root resorption and that's the radiology of the cementoblastoma and here you see a gross gross specimen gross specimen and in which the root resorption is clearly visible so in fact is the uh, a, a real tumor 
of cells that normally uh, lay down cementum on the tooth surface. And you can see that the lesion shows demarcation because the original cortical bone is expanded, but still recognizable. And here you can see the sharp border between the pre-existent jawbone and the cementoblastoma. And here you can see even better, here you can see still the initial periodontal ligament. You can see here how the lesion resorbs both the tooth as well as the alveolar bone. And here the corresponding histology. Now top down, you can see here the involved tooth and here the large mass that's firmly attached. And in at higher magnification, you can see here the fibrous tissue, the mineralized material that we call cementum because it's connected with the root surface. You see the cells here, and you can here see how the mineralized material merges with the tubular dentin, and this, quali this connection qualifies the lesion indeed as a cementoblastoma. Sometimes cementoblastomas as well as, uh, as, well as uh, osteoblastomas may be rather cellular. I have shown you already the spiculae and then any suspicion for malignancy. Uh, there may be some uh, worries about uh, malignant nature, but of course, as I told you, the radiology is quite often of a rather demarcated lesion. We have in the jaw one lesion, one variant of osteoblastoma that deserves some specific attention. That's a so-called epithelioid type. In the WSA book, you can find more on that. Here you see a radiolucency. That radiolucency was bioxide. And then you see here the lesion across uh, low power to show both the lesion itself as well as the adjacent jawbone that shows remodeling. That's also an issue that should be taken into account that quite often it's, will, it's rather difficult to distinguish a, a reactive bone remodeling adjacent to a lesion from the uh, uh, real lesion. And I will come back to that later on because it's quite important to, this, to decide whether bone formation may, uh, is uh, a component of the lesion itself or whether it's just a reaction of the adjacent bone of the jaw, because in one case you are dealing with a bone, bone forming tumor, and in the other case we are dealing with a lesion that evokes a remodeling reaction in the surrounding normal bone. And here you can see both. Here you see a remodeling here, 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 and here. And here you see how the lesion shows some, yeah, some demarcation but not real encapsulation. You can see that the lesion is composed of rather densely packed epithelioid cells that surround a mineralized mass that here shows heavy mineralization. And on higher magnification, you can see that the cells indeed look a little bit uh, epithelioid, epithelioid, but those epithelioid cells they form nevertheless osteoid that subsequently mineralizes. And this is a typical feature, a typical picture of the so called epithelioid, epithelioid osteoblastoma that uh, can, in a jaw, can be uh, confused with, a, with the uh, calcifying epithelial autosomic tumor. You can here see also epithelioid cells, in this case, of course, real epithelial cells that surround mineralized material 
But you can also see here that there is much more nuclear atypia. We have the so-called these gun rings already mentioned by Dr. Thekasin. But I am just including the, this epidemioid osteoblastoma to make you aware of the differential diagnosis with a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. And, of, and when you are in doubt, then of course, you know, will remember that the simple amyloid stain will be adequate to make a distinction because the COT shows positivity for amyloid, whereas the uh, epithelioid, uh, epithelioid osteoblastoma, of course, does not. So that's the, the take home message for the lesions that show osteoblastic differentiation. Uh, be, be aware that they, by their cellularity, they may mimic osteosarcoma, but then uh, remember the radiology that we have to distinguish between the cementoblastoma and the osteoblastoma, and that the epithelioid osteoblastoma may be confused with the calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. Now we will continue with a lesion that is really malignant, the osteosarcoma. The osteosarcoma in the jaw, in the jaw shows some specific features that make a distinction, a distinction with the osteosarcoma in the other parts of the skeleton and, uh, and, and also may uh, yeah, cause some differential diagnostic problems, and I have them summarized here for you. And they are that on the dental radiographs, we see quite often a widened periodontal ligament because the tumor spreads into that uh, periodontal ligament space. They are quite often of the chondroblastic subtype when they are mainly fibroblastic or mixoid, then we have a problematic differential diagnosis with mixoid jaw tumors and fibrosis lesions. And sometimes they show an epithelioid morphology that may mimic survivor gland carcinoma and a very important histological uh, discerning feature is the cellular margin. But we will, I will discuss these items and now in the order as you see them here on this slide. Here you can see an example of the widened periodontal ligament space here, here as well. So in fact, a tumor itself is yeah, not very easy to see. It's just a ground glass appearance of jawbone, but this, of course, is quite abnormal. This is quite abnormal in comparison with normal periodontal ligament space that you see here and here. And here you see a corresponding, corresponding histology, low power. This is the involved tooth with the endodontic treatment remnants of an endodontic treatment still visible, as you see here as well. You can see. Here, that there is some too much space, too much space between the bone of the alveolar socket here, as well as at this side. You see here some root resorption. Here also a resorption at the tip, and the tumor effect is barely visible, just growing here and here. And here you see some cellular rim. I will show you in more detail later on. This is quite, of course, quite more easy. Quite more easy, you see here again, a part of a jaw, the mandible, the covering mucosal lining, and you can see here how the tumor grows into the jaw bone, destroying the pre-existent cancerous bone, but, and that's very important also, perforating, perforating the cortical bone, lifting the periosteum and showing extra cortical 
uh, an extra cortical extension in the soft tissues. And in um, diagnosing the bone forming jaw lesions, this, uh, this is very important. Very important to that because you should realize that the benign bone forming jaw tumors all may always remain confined within the cortical, uh, the cortical shell. That cortical shell may be expanded, it may be uh, attenuated, thinned as well, but it remains a, cover, a, a structure that covers the tumor at the outside, and that covering here is lost, as you can see. And here you see then the cellular rim, as well as the chondroblastic component. Quite often on tiny biopsies, the uh, osteosarcomas of the jaw may be misdiagnosed as, as a chondrosarcoma. A chondrosarcoma because the osteoid, that's of course in this case visible here, that may be missing in a in a small biopsy, and that makes uh, a big distinction because nowadays the treatment for osteosarcomas and chondrosarcomas is different. Patients with osteosarcoma being subjected to neoadjuvant chemotherapy quite often, whereas the, that does not apply for the patients with chondrosarcoma. Just when you have in your biopsy a lesion that obviously looks malignant in which the cells themselves show chondroblastic differentiation, do not make the diagnosis of chondrosarcoma too, too easily, but be aware that you are, may be looking at a non-representative part of a jaw osteosarcoma. I think that's also uh, a message that should be taken at heart. Sometimes, and that's rather difficult, rather difficult for the uh, lesions in the upper jaw, a osteosarcoma may show some, uh, remem uh, some uh, resemblance to an epithelial architecture. Here you see a uh, lesion obviously showing those strands, strands in a rather dense collagenous tissue. And you can see some, some places that it is some fanning out of osteoid. But in general, the osteoid is not very conspicuous. And such a lesion like this may be mistaken for a salivary gland tumor that in that invades widely in the jaw bone, especially adenoid cystic carcinomas may show these epithelial strands that are compressed by abundant matrix formation. And such a, uh, such a picture as shown here in this low power view may suggest not an osteosarcoma, but a uh, but a salivary gland tumor that diff diffusely invades the bone. And here you see the, uh, at higher magnification, the same case. You can see here indeed how the malignant osteoblasts are arranged in strands, strands that are surrounded by a, uh, an osteoid that is rather poorly, poorly mineralized. You have to look for it to find it uh, here as, as visible here. Here you see more typical osteoid with a lining of swollen large osteoblasts. And other areas, this, this show uh, appearances like this, in which you see those strands, this, this lattice of cells with an intervening loose mixoid matrix may even also suggest some kind of a salivary gland tumor. That's something that also should be kept in mind that the epithelioid 
both osteoblastomas as well as osteosarcomas may mimic uh, uh, some other lesions when they have a predominant epithelioid, uh, when they show predominant epithelioid features. And here you see it as well, but again you can see that here the osteoid is lying in between the hyper uh, chromatic and hypertrophic osteoblasts, and here you see the uh, part that is in which the intervening tissue is more more mixoid. So you can see from these cases that osteoid production in osteosarcomas can also be, be rather limited, which will hamper uh, the ob obtaining the appropriate diagnosis. And here you see another case to emphasize that cellularity in osteosarcomas also may be uh, rather uneven distributed. Here you see again a mother tooth, some root resorption here, and you can see here that, that the tooth is surrounded by a tumor, a tumor in which the center is rather cell poor, and the cellularity is mainly present at the periphery, and, and even not everywhere. Here you see that the cellularity is rather poor. So you can see again from a slide like this that tumors may have a varying morphology in different areas which may of course arriving at the appropriate diagnosis not always, not always easy. But what is helpful here in this case is that you can see that the cellular rim is uh, is just covered by soft tissue, and that implies that this lesion has spread beyond the cortical bone, extending into soft tissues, and that should not be shown by a benign jaw lesion. Here you see the detail, and then you can see here the tumor, osteoid formation here, cellular rim here and you can but you can see here that in an area there is inflammation from the because the gingiva is inflamed the inflame, inflammatory infiltrate obscures the cellular rim entirely so when the biopsy would have been taken from this area here it would ha have been impossible to make the diagnosis because the diagnostic picture is not shown here in this part, but is shown here in this part, just to emphasize how important such a cellular rim is in making the diagnosis. It should be made. And here you see some remnants of the junction epithelium of the gingiva that has not yet been destroyed, of crushed, squeezed between tumor and tooth surface that you see here with a very small cemental covering layer. Showing this makes the jump to the uh, another area of the jaw bone pathology. The jaw bone pathology is so-called fibrosis lesions, fibrosis lesions that are that pose sometimes difficult diagnostic problems. Let's start with the skeleton. The skeleton is that we have some different different uh, types that we can recognize. The fibrous dysplasia, the ossifying fibroma with the various subtypes, one of them being autotogenic of origin, the others not, but taken here together for the sake of convenience. Then we have the cemental osseous dysplasia, the kind of hematomatous lesions that probably arise from the fibroblasts in the periodontal ligament. And then is the very rare, very rare familial gigantiform cementoma. Let's start with fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia, just to, to uh, refresh your knowledge, and 
uh, quite a lot of text, but the most important is that the lesional bone fuses with adjacent normal bone. And there is one difference between the fibrous dysplasia in the jaw with the fibrous dysplasia in other parts of the skeleton, that sometimes the lesion may mature towards lamellar bone, which is in principle not seen in lesions of fibrous dysplasia in other parts in the extra genetic skeleton. And of course, the lesions seem to stabilize, which means that treatment can remain rather, rather limited, just uh, for uh, to, to improve uh, cosmetic appearance or uh, rescuing nerve function. Here you see a quite typical maxillary case of fibrous dysplasia. The, the uh, maxillary sinus is completely obliterated by a lesion that shows a kind of a ground glass appearance. And what's also very important is that the lesion does not respect the sutures. Here you see the suture between the zygomatic bone and the maxillary bone. That should, here you see that the lesion involves both the maxillary bone as well as the zygomatic bone. And that's a, a very reliable radiologic sign that fibro lesions of fibrodysplasia they may involve adjacent bones. They may cross sutures, which of course, which of course is not seen, not shown by any other bone lesion. That's they are in a bone and they may destroy adjacent structures, but not just in this in this uh, way. And that's the first thing. And other thing is that for me at least that uh, the diagnosis of fibrodysplasia is the only indication at the time being for doing uh, molecular pathology. Molecular pathology looking at genes because our, the distinction between fibrodysplasia and ossifying fibroma that in the past has been a subject of a multitude of papers uh, is it now quite easy because fibrous dysplasia shows a mutation, shows a mutation in a gene that codes for a, a growth factor, the so called GNES, uh, GNES gene. And here you can see in this sequence, at this position, the lesion, the lesion contain, contains two different bases, two different peaks, which indicates that we have a normal peak as well as an abnormal peak, that means that in this place there is a heterozygosity for this gene by a mutation, and that mutation is diagnostic for fibrous dysplasia. For requiring to, uh, to demonstrate this mutation, the lesion, the tissue should not be decalcified. So it, the gene is resistant to formal fixation. So when the biopsy has been fixed in formalin, it can still be subjected to this type of uh, treatment. But when it's decalcified, then the DNA is uh, destroyed and the mutation cannot be shown anymore. So when you have those facilities, it will be helpful to remember that on biopsies you can make now reliably make a diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia because of the presence of that mutation AT replacing timidin, replacing cytosine. But of course, histology is still uh, yeah, most accessible. And here you see a part of a piece of bone from the a skull cap in this case that shows how the lesion indeed merges with the adjacent cancerous bone. Here you see bone hemopathic bone marrow, normal cancerous bone, and you see that you cannot draw a clear line between the lesion, the fibrous plastic lesion, and the adjacent normal bone. The merging is both with the cancerous bone 
as well as with the covering cortical bone. And you can see that the hemopathic marrow has been replaced by fibroblastic tissue, in which you see the bony sticulae, the bony trabeculae irregular, basically randomly arranged without a clear arrangement. And here you see that merging again, this is the lamellar adjacent bone, and here the the woven bone of fibrodysplasia, because in principle, fibrodysplasia only shows woven bone because it's actually a maturation defect. The, the mutation hampers the maturation of woven bone into lamellar bone, and that's why the lesion mainly consists of immature woven bone that fails to mature into. Uh, the normal lamellar bone and demonstration of lamellar bone versus woven bone, of course, is quite easy when you can you when you have your microscope is fit with the equipment for biofringence. Here you see the fibrous tissue, just blend fibroblasts and crescent-shaped bony trabeculae that do not show an osteoblastic rimming because fibrous dysplasia mimics the endesmal bone formation, endesmal bone formation in which bone occurs by condensation of pre-existent collagen and not by osteoblasts that uh, replace a cartilaginous precursor uh, stage into, into bone. So fibrodysplasia, endesmal bone formation, uh, and hence no clear osteoblastic rimming. And here you see another example, and again you see the curvy linear bony trabeculae, only a few flattened cells at the outside, but no, of almost no uh, osteoblasts, maybe a few flattened cells that suggest them, but it's not a bone covered by a dense rim of osteoblasts. It also is helpful in making the histological differentiation between fibrodysplasia and ossifying fibroma. And here you see uh, uh, something that is, of course, that's particularly interesting for oral pathologists because that shows the unique fibrous dysplasia in the jaws. Here you see that fibrous dysplasia may involve the maxillary tuberosity here, and here in other case, and here as well. And those, in those cases, the posterior maxilla, you can have a maturation towards the malar bone shown here in biofringent light, here the fibrous tissue, here the lamellar bone, and you can see that in that, those cases the uh, bony trabeculae show a kind of fingerprint appearance. So this is uh, unique for the, uh, for the maxilla, and that implies that when you have a biopsy from this area and you see a fibro-osseous lesion in which you see lamellar bone, that doesn't rule out the diagnosis of fibrodysplasia because in this area that maturation is allowed. Elsewhere, it's not. So far on fibrodysplasia, then we have the cement ossifying fibroma, odontogenic tumor, encapsulated. And that makes the big distinction, one of the big distinctions with fibrodysplasia that shows that merging that I have shown you. It is a real neoplasm and it shows demarcation. There is uh, osteoblastic rimming. There may be both woven and lamellar bone, also some areas that resemble cementum. So the, there is a much more uh, yeah, variation in mineralized material. Lesions may attain a huge size if left untreated, which sometimes is the case indeed. And here, a other case, you can see here that's indeed a well demarcated lesion. Sometimes there is some root resorption, as shown here, which also indicates a slow growing lesion. And here you see a gross specimen, a gross specimen in which you can see how the lesion indeed shows a demarcation. There is a demarcation between tumorous tissue and the adjacent cortical bone. That cortical bone is quite thin, at least here. Here it's slightly thicker 
here also, but this serves to, to show how the lesion shows a clear demarcation. But you can also see that when the biopsy is taken, maybe by example here, that the surgeon has to delve deep to reach the lesion. Otherwise, you have only some, some, some cortical bone that is, no, of course, non-informative. So it just the biopsies taken biopsies from a jawbone is not just taken only the, the skin of the orange, but also the flesh below. And here you see the histology. Here you see the, the cortical bone. You can see there is a clear demarcation. And here you can see the fibrous tissue with the bony trabeculae. Here the bony trabeculae also of varying size and varying appearance. Here in detail, they may be elongated and slender. They may be small, like uh, globules. And here you can see that the that it's not only woven bone, and you can see that it's not it is not merging. Here you see that what I already briefly alluded to before that the cement ossifying varroma shows a large variation in appearance of mineral mineralized material. You can have cementum like globules that may fuse to larger aggregates. You can have uh, deep basophilic calcifications. You see here bone with a covering of some osteoblast. And this makes a big distinction with fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia, the bony component is much, much more uniform, not showing this spectrum of appearances as shown in this cement ossifying fibroma. And that, of course, the, uh, yeah, makes a distinction at the histological level. We have two other types, two other types of ossifying fibroma that are the juvenile trabecular, mandibular, maxilla, and mandible. And that's uh, not an autogenic tumor. Its uh, importance lies in its rapid growth, rapid growth and rapid expansion, but it remains demarcated and the demarcation helps in distinguishing from the osteosarcoma but of course other problems also are lurking behind because we can also have osteoclastic giant cells which makes a distinction with the uh, central giant cell granuloma that also is a typical jaw lesion here you see another ex example of such a lesion you see the huge size and the, the dislocation of the teeth due to the tumor. But here you can see the other case of how the lesion remains covered by bone. It's not perforating into the soft tissues. It's still confined. And by, historic, uh, by gross appearance, I uh, would like to draw your attention to this those hemorrhagic uh, strands, those curve, curvy linear hemorrhagic strands, they can be found also by histology. Here you see, this is the histological uh, substrate of this gross phenomenon. And that's quite unique for this type of ossifying fibroma. You see here a cellular, uh, cellular areas that are surrounded by a fringe of radiating bony speculae. And at the interface, you see some microcystic degeneration. And this is the area where we can find also the giant cells. Here you see a histological detail to show the resemblance with osteosarcoma, quite cellular. Uh, extremely cell rich osteoid, large swollen osteoblasts. Here, another example to show the cellularity of the osteoid. The, uh, some mitotic figures may be present as well, but again, remember that a lesion that is demarcated and that uh, does not show the cortical perforation was a coma that I have shown you already before. But this, the, so this is the juvenile trabecular osteosar, 
ossifying um, fibroma mainly occurring in the upper jaw and quite unique for the uh, jaw bones not being found elsewhere. It has to be distinguished from juvenile somatoid ossifying fibroma that's occasionally seen in the jaw, but more often in the sinonasal cavities, in the periorbital periorbital frontal ethmoid bones. This lesion is unencapsulated and characterized by multiple small uniform ossicles in the cellular stroma, and the lesion may show uh, may transform into a mainly that's mainly cystic lesion. Here is, I show you some radiological features. Here you see an MRI here. Here you see in the ethmoid, lesion ethmoid sinus. Here as well, mainly a radio lucent lesion with some radio pack areas and here as well. And this is the typical feature. You see again that the lesion is not merging with the cortical bone and is composed of those globules, those ossicles, those ossicles that may merge into larger areas. And here you see another uh, example. Here you see the ossicles themselves here, here, and you can see also how those ossicles merge into some larger aggregates. The picture is rather, rather uniform, rather uniform, uh, that, that makes a distinction with the two other subtypes of ossifying fibroma and of course the location as well. But remember the typical smooth surfaced globules that are the hallmark, diagnostic hallmark of this lesion. And sometimes, and that's especially seen in the lower jaw, then the lesion may uh, feature itself as a large cyst. A large cyst. Here you see the corresponding swelling intraorally. Here you see how the lesion uh, manifested itself on exploration. A large hollow, hollow cavity within the mandible with the lesional tissue just confined to tiny areas in the wall. And that implies that the juvenile somatoid ossifying fibroma enters the differential diagnosis of the large cystic jaw lesions. Here you see the radiology and those, this lesional tissue only is confined to some areas here in the wall. And that implies that here the chance that it will be missed when biopsied, of course, is rather, uh, yeah, is not imaginary. And here, this is the specimen from that patient. You can see here how the roots of the tooth are just protruding into an empty, an empty space. And only here you can see some, some tuberous tissue, but it's mainly just a cavity covered with a very thin membrane. And here, an other piece to show here a part of a tooth. Here, the remaining jawbone, and here, saw the lesion tissue as a very small pseudo cystic lining. And here again, a detail to show that's not a cyst, but a real fibrosis lesion. So, now we continue because time is limited for cemento osseous dysplasia. The cemento osseous dysplasia. In which, which is divided in three variants, three variants on basis of anatomy, periapical, focal, and florid. And here you see it, periapical, just a small lesion in the anterior mandible, focal, sometimes a little bit larger in the posterior part of the jaw, and the florid involving multiple jaw areas. All have the same appearance, by histology, and you will also see that there is no that the, no merging of the mineralized material with the root, which makes the distinction with cementoblastoma. Cementoblastoma show a fusion of the tooth with the mineralized component of the lesion, such a fusion is not fusion is not seen 
in the cement osseous dysplasia. As you can see here as well, here you see a root tip and here the corresponding small cement osseous dysplasia that in histology mimics ossifying fibroma because it also shows a huge variation of mineralized material. So the distinction between ossifying, cement ossifying fibroma and cement osseous dysplasia is mainly made on basis of the clinical and radiological manifestation. Cement ossifying fibroma, an expensive lesion confined to one part of the jaw and the osseous dysplasia being small lesions, quite often only seen on radiographs taken for another reason. Sometimes the lesion is not at the root tip, but at the lateral side of the tooth surface as shown here. You can see here as well, no connection with the root. Here the expanded bone of the alveolar socket and here the cement osseous dysplasia with the cementum-like material as well as bone. So histologically identical to COF. And then we we have a couple of questions to answer, uh, and we have 10 minutes left. Yeah, I know. I know. When, when time is over, I will stop. We have to okay. get home cementoma. That's the final part that I would like to show you. And that's quite rare. In that case, the dysplastic cementous lesions, they cover they occupy large, very large jaw areas. And you see such a case of a young child. You see the Jewish masses in the upper jaw, here as well as here, here as well as here. And here you see the another projection just to show you this and to show you as well that qua histology is just resembling a cemento ossifying fibroma. So you see how for these lesions, the correlation between the uh, the correlation between the uh, radiology and the histology and the clinical appearance is mandatory for the correct diagnosis. Now the mimics, and in a few minutes that I have still left, I will, I think, skip a few things, but at first, but let's start with the low-grade osteosarcoma that may mimic cement ossifying fibroma. Here you see a picture fibrous tissue, but here, what I stressed already before, spread into the soft tissues, lifting of the periosteum, perforation of the cortical bone. So, in local osseous sarcoma, the border makes the distinction. And here, in detail, lifting of the periosteum, and here some reactive bone formation due to the lifting of the periosteum, not belonging to the lesion. So the border and the cortical, uh, and the relationship with the cortical border make a distinction between cement ossifying fibroma and low-grade osteosarcoma. Here again, in detail, reactive bone formation here, the lesion here just growing into the soft tissues. Periosteal fasciitis, that's another interesting case that may cause troubles because that may mimic osteosarcoma as well. It's also called as cranial, known as cranial fasciitis or periosteal fasciitis. Here you see the lesion. We see here lifting of the periosteum. We see a hollowing out of the cortical bone. We see here a mixoid tissue, mixoid tissue, bone formation. So could be a mixoid type of osteosarcoma. There is some hemorrhage, some pseudo mixoid stromal degeneration, but when going back, you will see that the lesion grows not from within the bone to the outside, but from the outside, hollowing out the bone. So it's in principle a periosteal lesion, and that periosteal lesion showed a typical USP6 rearrangement that makes a diagnosis as a periosteal fasciitis showing this genetic abnormality. It's one of the few things that are helpful in the differential diagnosis as well. And that same USP6 uh, rearrangement is found in the soft tissue, you know, the fasciitis, 
as well as in the small bone cyst. And then uh, I think I will skip kirubism because I think we all know that. Uh, we'll go back for the, uh, for the final slides to, um, oh, that's uh, not my intention. Share. We we'll go to this one. Yeah. Now, it doesn't work as I would like, but I will go here, the Hemencio, because I think that's the final case that I would like to discuss. Because we should realize that in interosseous hemangioma, we can quite often have excessive reactive bone formation, and that may mimic a bone forming lesion. Here you see an example. Here you see the lower jaw, the young child, as you can see, two germs, and you can see here excessive bone formation with some radiating features that suggest even osteosarcoma. But by histology, you can see here the jaw had to be taken out because of the hemorrhage. You can see here that the blood filled lakes and this here excessive thickening of the cortical bone. Here you see the fibrous tissue, here the tooth germ, and on histology here you see the large vascular spaces here and here, and you can see here the thickened cortical bone, periosteal bone formation as well. So this is a reactive bone formation due to an interosseous hemangioma. It's not quite often seen, and it may, of course, it may be overlooked because radiology suggests a bone forming lesion, but the bone forming is just a just evoked by the hemangioma, and that's why yeah, the, the lesion show this pattern. Here you see again the root surface, periodontal ligament, also thickening of the alveolar bone socket. And here in detail, the periosteal bone formation resembling cementum. You can imagine when you have a biopsy that only includes this area that you would be, have difficulties in making the correct diagnosis because the lesion is more deeply seated here in those vascular spaces. And then finally, already mentioned the sclerosis monogenic carcinoma may also mimic a bone forming tumor. I will not go in detail now, but only show you one case here a large lesion occupying a major part of the mandible, poorly defined. Here you see something that looks like a fibrosis lesion, a lot of fibrous tissue, bony trabeculae, mimics, uh, but on close examination you can see here the epithelial component, epithelial component, and here you can see it as well. The sclerosis of the carcinoma may sometimes evoke a very brisk fiber, uh, bone component as well that mimics a fibrosis lesion. But then you should realize here the, that there is an epithelial component as well. And by immune chemistry, of course, you can see that the epithelial component is much, much more uh, predominant than you would think just when looking at the plain age and E section. So that's, that's uh, I think, the final, the final case, the final clinical case. Remember that the sclerosing photophysogenic carcinoma may mimic a osteosarcoma, may mimic fibrous dysplasia when you overlook the epithelial component that may, may be rather, rather limited. And uh, this, of course, I think shows you some recent developments. And but I already told you, in fact, the only real useful uh, genetic tool in this area is the glass mutation in fibrous dysplasia. All other things are quite interesting from a biological point of view, but have not yet been found 
found their way into clinical practice. So far, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear professor, for your outstanding lecture and very nice slides and sections. Um, very nice quality, actually. Um, I would like to jump to the questions straight forward and uh, announce that the main uh, field that the audiences um, ask is about IHC study in differentiating uh, osteosarcoma from the mimickers, um, especially the low-grade osteosarcoma like periosteal osteosarcoma from other lesions like fibrous dysplasia and also uh, differentiating uh, conventional osteosarcoma from the mimickers based on IHC studies. Do you use IHC studies uh, a lot or even use it for any case? Well, I, 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 I've tried to explain, I think, the, the proof of the uh, pudding is in the, in the border, the border of the lesion, because the border is defining. The border is the merging of the lesion with the border. Then think about fibrous dysplasia. If you see a capsule between the lesion and the border, it's ossifying fibroma. And when you see that the lesion tissue is directly, uh, directly related with soft tissue without any intervening border, then be suspicious of malignancy. And I think that's still the most, most reliable diagnostic tool because uh, I think as you know the, the po point is that we have quite often uh, we are, we, the tissue that is submitted to the pathologist from the jaw is most often subjected to decalcification. Without decalcification we cannot make our slides. So that means that we are severely hampered in applying other diagnostic tools because decalcification will disturb the outcome of anything else than histology in a way that you cannot predict. So when you are doing maybe MDM2 immune chemistry for low-grade osteosarcoma, the negativity may be a real negativity, but may also be a negativity that is due to too excessive decalcification. And that's, and that's why I, because yeah, I am always very, very reluctant in relying on anything else than what I see through my microscope. And how about the positive cases? If you have positive results on immunistic chemistry, uh, do you judge on them or? Well, the, of, yeah, of course, that, but. Uh, then you should be sure that is, that is not false positive yeah. as well. That's, uh, that's why I think the only thing that I find reliable is the GNES mutation in fibrous crazy. That has been worked out very well, and that's quite reliable. There's a good correlation with microscopy if you have both available. But, yeah. for, but I have seen, uh, let's say, the literature, literature especially also on the MDM2, is still rather rather confusion and contradictory. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually classified the questions from three topics. Uh, one from osteoblastoma. The audiences had a question that uh, how can uh, uh, sorry what is the threshold for mitotic count in osteoblastoma? How many mitotic counts can we have in a benign lesion like osteoblastoma cellular lesion? Well, the, let's say you have to look for them. 
but in osteosarcoma, the, the, uh, the mitotic counts, they quite often can easily be found in osteo, let's say in osteoblastoma, there is a kind of discrepancy between the cellularity and the mitotic count. Uh, and you, you have one or two, you have to look quite a lot of fields. And, but the other thing is that you should not rely too heavily on mitotic counts. I think for osteoblastoma, it's much more important to realize that the osteoblasts, they are, they, they look, they look nasty, but realize that it is the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is not disturbed. So the cells with large nuclei have also ample cytoplasm. And yeah. that's not seen in osteosarcomas. Osteosarcomas, the nucleus enlarges at the expense of the cytoplasm. Yeah. And furthermore, in, uh, osteos in the osteoblastomas, you have quite, all, quite often uh, yeah, also areas in which there is quite some bone maturation. And, uh, but it, it, sometimes it's quite easy. And then you have also again to look at very carefully at the, at the radi radiology. Is it a demarcation or not? And how can we differentiate the lesions um, of osteoblastoma from in the active state? Uh, because many reactive states uh, mimic osteoblastoma. Can we differentiate them? Well, that when you have a, when you have a very small biopsy, very small biopsy that only includes the periphery of a lesion, then then maybe then you may be uh, indeed looking at reactive bone formation. But there is one thing. Reactive, in reactive bone formation, uh, the bony trabeculae are mostly arranged in a parallel fashion because they, there is a streaming. And yeah. osteoblastoma, the, the bony trabeculae are arranged randomly and not in such a, such a parallel pattern. Yeah. So uh, it is the architecture that... Architecture. The architecture arranges. Yes. Uh, Another question. Sorry, is sorry for interruption, uh, Professor Slutweg and Dr. Shushtarizade. Uh, I think we have five minutes to the next uh, panel, and because Professor Slutweg is the first lecture of the next panel, uh, I think that um, it would be better to uh, finish this panel at, at this at this moment, if you would let me. Uh, sorry, I, I do apologize for interrupting you, but I think uh, Professor Sudwig need to have a short rest for the next lecture. Very kind, very kind for you, being kind to an old man. <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> no. maybe, it may be, uh, it's, it's possible that you make some compilation of the questions, send them by email, and then yes. I, can say, I can say that I can make a kind of combined, combined uh, comment that can be uh, sent back to the participants? Yes, 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 definitely. Yes, they, ca they can send, they share their uh, questions with us in chat box and we will share it with you and give the uh, answers and let them know about the answer of the questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shishnarizadeh. I, I would like to ask my colleague to share the certificate of uh, our uh, eminent professor, uh, Dr. Slutbeck, and also uh, Dr. Shushtarisade. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Slutbeck, for sharing your uh, brilliant knowledge with us in this panel. And also, next one, please. And also, Dr. Shushtarizade, thank you for joining us and being thank with you. us thank in you. this panel. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, for okay. the moderator. <laughs> thank you. And uh, it's a great pleasure that we have uh, Professor Dr. Skalova for the next panel. Uh, uh, Professor Skalova, we have three minutes to the next panel. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Wow. wonderful. So let me know when we should start. I am. I joined you already for 
10 minutes. So uh, no, we, we will start in three minutes. If you Excellent. would let us, we will have three minutes. Uh, if you would uh, let uh, Professor Studek uh, have a short break for three or uh, for three minutes and we will back soon. Thank you Wonderful. very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back all to the third panel of the fifth Congress of Iranian Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists Association. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, so far, and uh, I recommend you to stay with us uh, for the last panel. Uh, uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to have uh, Professor Dr. Eskalova as moderator uh, of the third panel. Uh, I think no need to introduce, introduce uh, Dr. Eskalova. Uh, she's well known in uh, head and neck pathology and um, uh, she's a professor of uh, the Charles University of Czech, Czech Republic with uh, many, many publications. Uh, and uh, I think no need for any introduction. Also, it is a great pleasure for us to have a figure of oral pathology in Iran, uh, Professor Dr. Eslami. Uh, he will be with us in this panel, and I will ask him to join us during the panel and share uh, his uh, brilliant 
comments or uh, questions uh, during the panel. Uh, 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 therefore, Professor Escalova, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation again um, uh, to attend and moderate this panel. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude and pleasure to to got opportunity to uh, to be with you uh, thank you for invitation thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel um, to all organizing people and uh, in particular associate professor uh, dr Buyan. Uh, and thank you for very kind words uh, uh, to introduce me, but uh, I uh, have to to correct you. My role is going to be very minor, and the major speaker and major celebrity actually is a professor Pieter Slodbeck, and it's absolutely my 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 pleasure uh, to um, to try to introduce him. I believe that he's got very good introduction already, but it's it's uh, it's my honor to say that. Uh, Professor Slotbeck not only is a great scientist and absolutely wonderful scientific personality, but he's also a very kind person and very good friend. And I believe that he will be uh, in con uh, that he will agree with me that we are really uh, personal friends. Professor uh, Slotbeck is uh, uh, retired already from the professor position, but he's a lifelong honorary member of the International Association of Oral Pathologists. And more importantly, he has a so uh, amazing and wonderful scientific production. He has been uh, author and co-author of more than 300 uh, peer-reviewed papers and what I appreciate absolutely high is his uh, um, his um, um, uh, his participation, but not participation, a leading role in uh, publishing of many uh, chapters and many wonderful books. Uh, at least uh, I would like to mention um, WHO classifications, where Professor Slotberg was one of the. Uh, main editors and head and neck pathology of WHO's classification is a, his a, and uh, the baby of the other editors. But that's uh, not possible to speak about all uh, scientific and uh, literary uh, achievements. And I believe that it's time to say that I'm absolute, I'm very, very much looking forward to your talk, Pierre. Uh, the, te te the title of the presentation is Salivary Gland Lesions, New Developments and Their Relevance, and the stage is yours, and I am really curious and really very much looking forward to your presentation. Well, dear Ria Kropskalova, I think our, our relationship dates back to almost 30 years. In Cape Town, I think we met for the first time. And since then, we have seen each other quite often. And I, I absolutely agree with you say about our personal relationship. And I'm happy that we can put a new, a new uh, shackle and that chain that connects us already for so many years. And again, uh, thanks for the organizers allowing me to speak here about another topic in oral head and neck, or head and neck pathology. In fact, I feel a little bit embarrassed because Professor Scalafa is much more uh, renowned for saliva gland pathology than I am. So uh, I hope that she will not be too critical for what I'm saying in the next uh, 45 minutes because some, we, we quite mostly we agree, but sometimes quite, quite rarely we agree that we disagree about something. And, but that's the way science progresses, not by being uh, of the same opinion, but just by being having different opinions. So far, as uh, to start now, I will see if I can again uh, go to my uh, presentation. And that looks as it should, indeed. Indeed. Um, yes. 
the, yeah, the, as I told you already, the new WHO classification the effect is not quite really so new anymore, but it's uh, because it's already now three, uh, almost four years, at least three years ago that it was published and our, our, uh, our deliberations on it also were still more remote in the past, but maybe as long as it not is as long as it has not been replaced by another classification, we can still it, call it the new. And the new and it's new because of course there are new entities, but also because there are new concepts, new concepts how to rearrange things that are already known. And that's the fact something that uh, yeah that co is connected with any any classification with any effort to to create order to create order in nature to create order in oncology also to create order in survival event pathology and that's what here you see some of those uh, yeah concepts how to conceive we have of course newly listed entities and variants there you have already the first topic. Is something a new entity or is it only a variation on a theme already known? Uh, that will not, that's, that in fact is one of the most difficult items to make a decision because some people say it's really something new and others say no, 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 it's just that old dog only with a slightly different color. So that will be a discussion lasting forever, I suppose. Sometimes biology uh, necessitates that there should be terminology shifts. <coughs> Maybe I may refer to the fact that in the first, first WHO classification, many, many years ago, we spoke about a cynic cell tumor and mucopyramid tumor. At, at that time, it was not yet known that those regions were really malignant. And that's why they were called tumor and not carcinoma. And now we know more. And that's maybe so terminology shifts may result from uh, an increase in biological knowledge. Then we have indeed the conceptual changes and controversies in which the mindset of the uh, <coughs> discussions is, uh, differs. And finally, molecular features may. Uh, have to be included, and that will be an everlasting uh, new area, I think, because they are, uh, yeah, they are found so often that we don't know, sometimes do not know how to handle them. Here you see the classification as it is nowadays, and of course you will, and you can imagine that I will not go into detail in, <coughs> in anything, just just highlighting a few issues that I think are illustrative to show the several uh, items I briefly addressed already. And of course, it's always good to start with something new, something new. And it's my pleasure to start with something new that comes from the desk of uh, my moderator, the memory analog secretory carcinoma that uh, was a real, real new entity, both morphologically as well as on basis of genetics. We have two other, some other new things that I will come briefly uh, return uh, shortly. The sclerosis, polycystic adenosis, and other epithelial lesions that are not so important from oncological point of view, but because they have to be recognized to know what you're dealing with. Secondary carcinoma, <coughs> generally low grade, morphological resemblance to, to a typical cancer in the breast and a typical genetic uh, uh, alteration. The growth uh, pattern is a little bit similar to cynic cell carcinoma. That's, the, I think, the reason that most cases, uh, when, then when you go to your files of survival event tumors, that you can find that case among cases that initially had been uh, classified as a cynic cell carcinoma. That was at least in my files was the case. I put them initially under that 
uh, in, in that uh, pocket, but now I know better thanks to that, uh, the data provided by Prof. Scarova. Here you see the different patterns, different patterns that may be shown by the lesion, solid, maybe microcystic, more or less solid metallic, uh, gross cystic, small cystic areas, and here uh, looking at some eosinophilic uh, secretions inside the lumina. And that's, uh, and especially, I think, especially this pattern shown here, more or less resembles the cynic cell carcinoma. And it's, so it is understandable why that lesion has been put in that pocket in the past. But now with the typical uh, genetic alteration, we know for better. And also we know for better because it may show a typical immune chemical um, expression of MUC4, which is also very, very helpful. And in my previous talk, I was a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit reluctant about the application of additional tools in making a diagnosis. Of course, for survival of blend pathology, the issue is entirely different. In fact, in this area, big steps have been made, both in, in unraveling genetic backgrounds of tumors, as well as in the practical application of that, of those newly discovered features. That so far on the mask in the past now called the secretary carcinoma. Another thing that is recognized as an entity that had to be listed in the WSO Blue Book is the sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Polycystic adenosis is a disease that mainly occurs in the uh, parotid gland, well demarcated, and because of the combination of myxomatous material and microcystic areas in the past, quite often confused with pleomorphic adenoma. But when looking, when having a closer look, you can see here the pattern that, that is not a tumorous stroma, but is a, just a, a fibrous pre-existent stroma in which you have cysts, microcysts lined with flattened epithelium, sometimes some mucus cells here in the lining, also solid areas, solid areas in which the cells are large and swollen. And in the past, the, some people made a comparison with the adenosis of the breast, in which you can have also a combination of epithelial proliferation filling the ducts together with uh, fibrosis and formation of tiny cysts. Here you see some specific, specific features. Here you see another, that's that the remaining HCNI, quite often the cells in them quite often show deposition of rather coarse, coarse eosinophilic globules that uh, may also be helpful in making that diagnosis. And also you can have some fatty accumulation and here you can see that the cells can have a foamy cytoplasm. So this lesion was listed as a, yeah, a non-tumorous lesion in the last WHO classification. But quite recently, we are now in another position because the suspicion that already arose long ago that maybe it was not a reactive lesion but a real tumor is confirmed by a paper that has just appeared in Hellenic pathology in which a genetic aberration has been shown and so we see that that lesion that has just made it to be listed in WHO Blue Book as a non-neoplastic entity, probably in, the, in a new forthcoming 
classification has to be listed among the tumors. And that's just an example how increasing knowledge may uh, force a reclassification, uh, putting from one region, uh, from region into another category. And that's why I included this lesion in my presentation, because it shows how, maybe how short-living some ideas also can be. A lesion just entering as reactive already uh, uh, referred to the neoplastic category. I think that will not apply to the two hyperplasias that are taken, uh, that are included, not because they are tumors, but because they may be mistaken for tumors. The so-called intercalated duct hyperplasia, an aggregate of ducts, sometimes more or less circumscribed as shown here, and sometimes more or less conforming to the architecture of a lobule. It is just an aggregate of ducts without any adjacent HNI, but and I think that you will agree that especially something like this can be mistaken for a small, tiny adenoma, but it's just a hyperplasia of a piece, a segment of the uh, branching duct system of the cell that characterizes the cerebrary lens. And here you see another type, so-called nodular oncocytic hyperplasia. Oncocytes mostly are deep orange, by the way, sometimes they are, have a more clear cytoplasm as shown here. And here you can see how here those nodules of oncocytic cells lie dispersed among a rotted gland that shows pronounced fatty, fatty changes. And here you can see the large aggregates, but mostly it's multifocal. Here you see tiny, small aggregates as well. So it's just an increase in, uh, in cells with oncocytic appearance that also should not be mistaken for, let's say, a multifocal tumor manifestation. Sometimes lesions, uh, some terminology shifts, shown here, the, the uh, rather ill-defined group of the papillomas. We have a ductal papilloma in general uh, uh, that serves as umbrella term for inverted and intraductal papilloma. And I will show you both. Here we see the inverted ductal papilloma. You see here a covering of a mucosal lining here. And we see here that's a kind of, yeah, and let's say large fields of epithelium. And typical is that at the luminal side, they are covered with cylindrical cells. And underneath, you find more, you can find more spindle shaped cells and <coughs> here in this area sometimes there may be some mucus formation and that's the reason that the inverted ductal papilloma incidentally may be confused with a, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma at least that's my experience from my consultation practice and of course, you can understand when you have only a biopsy in which you cannot see the typical architecture that is a pitfall that uh, yeah that not easily uh, avoidable. Here you see the intraductal papilloma, of course, a large dilated duct in which the Neoplastic epithelium forms a branching papilloma. Both lesions, both the inverted ductal papilloma as well as the intraductal papilloma, are quite, quite rare. And that <coughs> makes also that they are not so well, yeah, that the, most pathologists are not so 
familiar with them. Now, an area in which there is more discussion, because that discussion also has clinical implications. In the previous WHO classification, we noted uh, there was a lesion listed as polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma, and in the new WHO, the qualifier low-grade has been dropped. Why? Because uh, the lesion, in general, the lesion is low-grade, but not always. So that was mainly the reason to, to, so that people would not be uh, would not take the lesion too too easy too easy by being uh, yeah reassured by the qualifier low grade and because it's not always low grade as it will show you shortly then an area in which uh, the controversy variant or separate entity played a role that was the so-called cribriform adenocarcinoma of the minor salivary glands. Is that still belonging to the spectrum shown by polymorphous adenocarcinoma, or does it deserve a separate uh, recognition as a separate entity? It was a subject of uh, much discussion and uh, has been left undecided at that time. Then a very, very uh, yeah, confusing group of lesions, the so-called uh, so lesion, uh, lesion so-called intraductal carcinoma. We know that lesion, of course, from the breast and also in the salivary gland. There are lesions that are composed of obviously malignant-looking epithelium without any invasion. And for them, in the past, quite a lot of different terms have been proposed, shown here, low-grade cribriform cystadenocarcinoma, low-grade slivery carcinoma, slivery carcinoma in situ. We have tried to put some order in that by considering them to be one group, one entity with a variation in appearance and also recognizing that the lesion may be either low grade or high grade. So we speak about high grade or low grade interdeductal carcinoma. Another point that this was quite de heavily debated was the grading in mucal epidermal carcinoma. And finally, the, uh, we recognized that that the, that the border, the border between high grade and low grade may not be as easy as is sometimes assumed. There may be uh, low grade lesions may transform into high grade lesions, which of course has clinical consequences as well. Polymorphous low grade endocarcinoma, not always low grade. Here you see a small lesion in the pellet of a patient. But in another patient, we see a huge and ulcerating lesion. And that's one of those examples in that in which you already can see by clinical appearance that it would be strange to call a lesion like this low grade, especially when looking at the corresponding uh, radiograph, massive expansion, massive destruction. And here, the corresponding gross specimen you can see hemorrhage, destruction of the floor of the maxillary sinus. Here, the lower nasal turbinate to show how the tumor has also destroyed the nasal floor. So you can see that that are not the, the features of a low-grade uh, carcinoma. And that's what, just what to illustrate why the, in the group that was uh, that this debated the salivary gland pathology for WHA Blue Book. I was not part of that group. They decided that it was better to, to uh, skip the qualifier low grade. In, in principle, of course, 
histology of the low grade of the polymorphous endocarcinoma is quite typical, uh, not very invasive, just not encapsulated, but also not widely invasive. Lobules, intervening fibrous septa. Here, some perineural growth. Here you see the nerve. Here you see some cribriform areas. I, time does not permit to show quite a lot of histological details. That's why I'm just briefly uh, alluding to it. But to show you the, some typical features of the of the polymorphous endocarcinoma. And here the cribriform variant. It, uh, in, when you see cells with some those empty nuclei here, the papillary arrangement, here the cribriform areas, microcysts, and what we call the so-called glomeruloid architecture, mimicking the renal, the glomeruli, as can be seen in the kidney. So um, low grade, uh, the, you see low grade is still ingrained in my memory. I should erase that because we speak about polymorphous renal carcinoma, but when you have spoken about low grade for 25 years, it's not easy to get rid of that nomen <laughs> nomenclature. But anyhow, uh, here you see the cribriform, typical cribriform pattern that probably, possibly deserves uh, to be recognized as belonging to a different entity and not within the spectrum of the polymorphous endocarcinoma. But just, I will not make a decision here, it's just to show you how things uh, uh, are going. Then the introductory carcinoma, just a lot of text, but we can, I, I think I need some textual uh, information to share with you. We have this intracystic and intraductal perforation. The other, the older names I already mentioned can be graded as low, intermediate, or high. Low grade tumors are mostly cystic and cribriform and peperidal patterns, and the cells also may show varying features cuboidal, mucinous, epocrine, and of course, cellular atypia, with or without necrosis and mitotic figures are confined to the intermediate and high grade forms. And just to show you a few patterns, but also to show you the pitfall, here you see an intraductal component with uh, here the, in, the uh, interluminal cystic appearance. It a little bit looks like the Roman arches shown in the duct, intraductal of the carcinoma situ in the female breast. But here you see that there is already also an invasive component present as well. Here you see uh, an area in which there is some mucinous secretion in the lumina, some papillary formation as well. Here and here without obvious invasion. And here you see also a micropapillary pattern that can be seen in the female breast also. And here the, the, the papillary, the papillary pattern. And here in combination with the Roman arches. But here again, you see already the presence of an invasive component as well. So at least the cases that I have seen in the, in the last years of my professional active life, in almost all cases, the intraductal carcinoma had an invasive component as well, if you looked for it. And I maybe I can be happy to hear from a moderator after this presentation, her opinion about this. For me at least, seeing an intraductal pattern means that you have to be suspicious for an invasive component somewhere as well. And here, the combination of the Roman arches pattern, mucus formation, and here again here, the combination of an in situ component with an invasive component as well to illustrate the point I already mentioned just ago. Then something with, I think that 
that uh, is of importance for all of you because that is a point quite often seen, quite often seen in practice. We all know that pleomorphic adenoma may be combined with a carcinoma, ex pleomorphic adenoma. And then the issue is uh, how to handle that. And I think here we have been yeah, rather successful in creating a clear clinical guideline. Pleomorphic adenoma with intercapsular carcinoma, malignancy, not spreading beyond the initial pleomorphic adenoma, minimally invasive and widely invasive. Here you see the corresponding, the corresponding uh, picture. We see here that we have a pleomorphic adenoma no, uh, without any problems. Then within that pleomorphic adenoma, there can be an abnormal luminal proliferation either of the luminal cells, shown here, or the myopathelial cells, as shown here. And then we have the minimal invasive. Now the malignant cells have perforated the capsule of the pleomorphic adenoma, but the spread into the surroundings is limited. And that spread can be either the ductal cells, as shown here, or it can be the myopathelial cells, more spindle-shaped, as shown here. And then when that spread progresses over a larger distance, then we have the widely invasive. The widely invasive carcinoma ex of carcinoma. And that means then that we are dealing with a lesion that shows a combination of pleomorphic adenoma and uh, obviously malignant looking component as well, then you have to decide whether it's an intercapsular carcinoma. Intercapsular carcinoma replaces the older terms of a typical pleomorphic adenoma of carcinoma in situ ex pleomorphic adenoma. So that's, those terms have to be avoided. Then we have the minimally invasive and the widely invasive. Here you see such a obviously malignant looking tumor component. Is it within a pleomorphic adenoma or is it not confined with it within that limits? Here in detail. And here is the point that I would like to make. Sometimes the initial pleomorphic adenoma is quite difficult to find because it may be rather small or it may be heavy, heavily calcified. And then it's not uh, sampled when you are grossing the lesion because we all prefer to process the lesions, the, those parts that are much easier to cut than the calcified parts. But in this case, the calcified parts should be grossed as well because those calcified, calcified parts especially may be the initial pleomorphic adenoma from which the malignancy has arisen. Here you see another example here, a, a, a more or less necrotic calcified mass that repre represents the, the uh, initial pleomorphic adenoma, the pre uh, so-called precursor lesion surrounded by the widely invasive malignant component. And here you see an uh, area in which you can see here the part is more or less cartilaginous, resembling uh, representing the initial pleomorphic adenoma, and here the huge malignant component as well. And here you see histology, you can see here the center, central calcified and sclerotic highlight nodule, the pre existing pleomorphic adenoma. Here the pre existing gland, submandibular gland in this case, and here the widely invasive carcinoma that has obviously progressed beyond the three to five millimeter margin that is allowed for the minimally invasive pleomorphic adenoma. And here another, here you see an example in which the complete lesion is still covered with a thin capsule. Here maybe the capsule is almost lost. So you can 
you can struggle, debate whether this is still intracapsular or maybe minimally invasive, but it doesn't matter because minimally invasive has to be treated in the same way as intracapsular. But just to show you that things may sometimes be a little bit difficult to decide because always in nature we are dealing with the spectrum and that and our, our borders are just artificial cuts in that spectrum. And here another sclerotic hyaline nodule, pre-existing pre-morphic lenoma, and here you see the invasive component together with a lymph node metastasis. Here as well, you can see a distinction between the, normal, the remnants of the normal lymph node that's for a large part occupied by this salivary gland adenal carcinoma. And of course, a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma should not be confused with the multinodular recurrent B9 pleomorphic adenoma, especially in the parotid gland. Uh, pleomorphic adenomas that have not been taken out completely may recur. Here we are looking behind the ear of a patient. Here you see the multiple nodules of the recurrent pleomorphic adenoma, and here the corresponding histology, skin, subcutaneous fat, and here quite a lot of those nodules, and this of course is uh, very, very difficult to remove, but it's not malignant. It's just a recurrent B9 pleomorphic adenoma. Then grading of the mucoepidermoid carcinomas, I can be rather brief on that. Low grade, especially mucous cell rich, well circumscribed, intermediate, less circumscribed, and also less uh, mucine, and high grade, and high grade, we have to look hard to find some mucine. So rule of thumb, especially the easiness with which you can find mucinous differentiation more or less determines the grade of malignancy. Here you see a low grade, quite a lot of mucin. Here is mucous cells in a wall. Here the intermediate grade, solid components, but still mucin recognizable as well. And here the high grade, Hard to look for an occasional mucous cell present somewhere. Transformation to higher grade. I have to be a little bit uh, speedy now because time is running fast. We see transformation to higher grade adenoid cystic carcinoma. Here, adenoid cystic carcinoma, classical. Here, the high grade component, large cells, mitotic figures. And that a huge amount of cytoplasm that should not be seen in the normal adenoid cystic carcinoma, that of course may, although low grade, show huge permeation in the jawbone, as shown here, or in the soft tissues in the upper lip, as shown here. So it is not a growth pattern so much that determines high grade transformation, but just indeed the histology. And here you see the classical histology just to uh, refresh your memory. And of course, even the low grade may show lung metastasis is shown here, here, here as well. And here you can see those tiny white nodules, very small nodules, larger nodules as well here. And of course, this patient died due to metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma even in spite of being low grade. And here we can also have high grade transformation in the cynic cell carcinoma. Here you see the high grade component that obviously different, differs from the uh, conventional pattern shown at the left side of this slide. And of course, here again, it's not the uh, history, the uh, Growth, this growth, but the histology that makes a distinction because the cystic cell carcinomas, also the low grades, can show diffuse growth into the soft tissues. And you see here, from this case, in the cheek, covering cheek mucosa, underlying soft tissue, and here the tumor that lacks any demarcation. 
also the myoepithelial, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma may show high grade transformation. Here you see such a case in which you can see that the clear cells show high grade nuclear abnormalities, large nucleoli. Here the ductal cells still present is mainly the myoepithelial component here that has underwent that transformation to a higher grade. And here, just to show the usual pattern of the classical epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma, ductal lumina lined with dark cells with a cuff of the clear myoepithelial cells surrounding. Molecule markers. Now, I, uh, uh, here you see how you can differentiate them between diagnostic that will helpful in making the diagnosis for a secretory carcinoma and the clear cell carcinoma and prognostic for a salivary duct carcinoma, both here especially translocations diagnostic and prognostic it may be both mutations, amplifications, mutations and copy gains, no translocations so much. Clear cell carcinoma already mentioned briefly by uh, the Dr. Tekkersen in the jaw, here you see the, the clear cells, sometimes fibrous tissue as in, in the septa, here the high detail, here you see how they show, how they show here the cells with the, the translocation, you see here the, the dots, sometimes dots close to each other, sometimes dots wide apert, this indicates that there has been indeed a translocation. And we see here indeed that the cells may be nuclear positivity for P63. But that's of course that's not so much helpful because my epithelial cells may, may do that as uh, well. Slide root carcinoma to end with. An aggressive epithelial malignancy present a high grade memory ductal carcinoma, mostly the protein gland, rapidly progressive, widely metastasis. Sometimes you can find in a neck dissection specimen over 100 positive nodes, but uh, especially this tumor is uh, prone to uh, more advanced treatment policies. Here you see the classical appearance when described first, comedotype necrosis, here a rim of epithelial cells, microcyst, central necrosis, here in detail, here the famous androgen receptor positivity, one of the first uh, abnormalities detected, it made it accessible for tailored treatment with chemotherapy, now there are quite a lot of trials running for that case, we have now also several histological manifestations, sarcomatoid, mucin rich, invasive and macropapillary, oncocytic, and approximately 70% has the androgen receptor positivity, and HER2 expression is found in 25 to 30% of cases. And these additional features allow also the application of tailored chemotherapeutical treatments. Here you see this from the WHO Blue Book, some patterns, classical pattern, here more fibrous, here a detail, here the micropapillary pattern, and here the staining for the, uh, staining for the androgen receptor, and here the staining for the RDD2, HER2, allowing treatment tailored at that uh, growth factor receptor. So far, my point regarding saliva event pathology that I would like to share with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and now we have a uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, the uh, talk was uh, full of uh, 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 of um, wonderful uh, opportunities to discuss. 
too many, too many opportunities. You covered so many uh, um, controversial issues in the salivary gland pathology. I, I'm, it's a tempting to discuss many things, but we uh, have a limited time. And I believe that it's a good idea to start with the questions of participants, uh, which I tried to, uh, to check. Uh, but, uh, two of them are somehow related to really uh, quite important topic also for me, and that's uh, distinguishing uh, or controversies uh, between uh, intraductal carcinoma and salivary duct carcinoma. The question asks, uh, is uh, the, uh, the name intraductal carcinoma justified? Is it justified? If we have an invasive component there, uh, there was a, something like that. Yeah. So, how would you comment the the relationship between salivary duct carcinoma, the aggressive conventional type, and intraductal carcinoma? Yeah, that, that's a very very difficult very difficult point because there's much discussion whether intraductal carcinoma is a precursor lesion for invasive carcinoma. But I, th I, think, uh, I think that the point that the most, the clinically, the clinically most uh, important feature should determine nomenclature because that decides how to treat. So I would prefer, and I did in that case, sign out those lesions as a salivary duct carcinoma invasive with a in situ component as well, just in a descriptive way and recommending treating the patient as should be done for an invasive ductal carcinoma without an in situ component. Because in, when you, yeah, I think, and that's an old, there's of course an old axiom, I think in medicine, that the most, the most dangerous features, they should be attacked in treatment. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that you uh, answered the, 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 the sh short question of the participant because you were, Pete, you were so kind to ask for my own opinion about uh, introductal carcinoma, I will use a uh, few um, uh, seconds to, to react. I believe that uh, I have uh, the same opinion as you have, uh, that uh, salivary duct carcinoma, high-grade aggressive is a di distinctive entity. It's a something different than intraductal carcinoma, that we should not go back to the term salivary duct carcinoma low-grade, that was confusing, that should not be done. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my uh, special comment is that I very much agree with you. I have seen more than about 40, almost half of cases of correct real, real introductal carcinomas, yeah, according to the, with immunoprofile, you did not mention typical immunoprofile, but immunoprofile, including molecular genetics, introductal carcinoma with invasion. Yeah. And we actually do have a new paper in HESP uh, recently where we co uh, covered this topic and I somehow challenged also uh, the term, WHO classification term, introductal carcinoma, saying that it's not proper because we really see these invasive uh, cases. We have we had all, all, even one case with intra-lymph node metastasis of yeah. the introductal carcinoma, and we provided evidence of translocation ECO4 red which is typical for introductal carcinoma and not seen in salivary duct. So to make the story clear and short, I believe there are two entities, salivary duct carcinoma and introductal carcinoma, but the name is misnomer. Yeah. And we suggested the term intercalated duct carcinoma, invasive, non-invasive, apocrine, and non-apocrine variant, something like that. Yeah, so, but uh, I, think, I think this is, this is one of the areas in which new knowledge should uh, it yeah, allows us to make better, better uh, an improved classification in the future? Yeah, 
Uh, now I would like to ask uh, uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Puyang, please give us permission to continue in discussion or do we need to continue? There are several other questions for the, from the participants. Maybe we should postpone the questions to the end of the panel and then give, now uh, give the opportunity to the other speakers. What do you think? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, great presentation. I think we have uh, about five minutes for more questions and after that we can uh, continue with Professor Dr. Azmude uh, for the second lecture. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really prefer uh, when we have uh, this close contact with Professor Slotbeck to continue because uh, uh, the, uh, someone from audience asked, how would you differentiate between oncocytoma and oncocytic multifocal uh, hyperplasia? That was the beginning of your talk. Yes, well, I think that that should not be too difficult because oncocytic hyperplasia itself will never uh, need for surgical intervention because you will, you will find it in, uh, in specimens that have been taken out for something else because it's just the minute lesions that are dispersed in the parotid gland and that never are, uh, yeah, by, that by themselves do not require any treatment because they even go unnoticed. It's just that you should know about their presence when you are looking let's say for a specimen that has been taken out for a pre-morphic adenoma. And then you have a specimen or maybe for something else. And then you should not think that the nodular hyperplasia uh, is part of, a, of the tumor, thus thinking about invasion. And let's say you, when you are mistaking nodular hyperplasia for remote tumor deposits that are connected with the lesion, present elsewhere in the same specimen, then you will make a failure. That's effectively the, the reason that those lesions, those lesions has been uh, put in the new classification. Just be aware that they are present, that they can be found in specimens that have been taken out for something else and do not make the, the error that you think they are related to that main lesion. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I very much agree, and I believe that also uh, looking at the solitary nodule, which is encapsulated, is a fine diagnosis of oncocytoma benign, while multifocal oncocytic hyperplasia usually affects astenae, ductal structures, uh, there are uh, nodules of different size, so usually as a professor Slodrex said, uh, it's uh, quite easy. And I will continue with some, uh, one more question, which is a little bit difficult because there are very many short, short, short names. So the question is, if, uh, uh, what's your experience, dear professor, with uh, uh, IHC, which means immunohistochemistry, between PA, which means pleomorphic adenoma, versus ACC, which I believe that it's adenocystic carcinoma. So uh, do you use any immunohistochemical markers to differentiate between pleomorphic adenoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma? No. 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 <laughs> it, should be, it should be the pattern. Eh? Uh, uh, in my experience, at least, <coughs> in adenoid cystic carcinoma, the myoepithelial cells never lose, never lose any any epithelial connection. In the primary adenoma, the myepithelial cells, they make matrix, and by that makers, matrix production, they become loose from each other. And so they become like isolated in the matrix. That's something that you never see in an adenoid cystic carcinoma. In adenoid cystic carcinoma, the pleomorphic of the, the material cohesion is not disturbed. And for, so when you, you could do immune chemistry, then when you see that cytokeratin positive cells are lying single in the matrix, mm -hmm. then it's pleomorphic adenoma. But uh, 
Yeah, I think that's not necessary. It's just just look look at region C that the epithelial cohesion is not lost, then it's not a prima of granuloma. I very much uh, thank you for this uh, this comment, which is based on a, a deep knowledge of histomorphology on H and E. I am a person who involved uh, who is involving more and more in my differential diagnostic considerations, molecular testing, and immunohistochemistry. Other, uh, 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 but in contrast, I absolutely agree that this morphological background is for differentiation between pleomorphic adenoma and adenoid cystic, uh, the, the much, much better. If you really want to use uh, um, ancillary tools and sophisticated methods, there are surrogate immunohistochemical markers, of course, which we have in our laboratory, PLAG1, PLGA1, immunohistochemistry helps and works well for pleomorphic adenoma while uh, MIB MIB is a surrogate marker for, for a MIB and FIB translocation typical for adenoid cystic that can be used but I, I agree very much with Professor Sodbeck that uh, uh, the morphological uh, observation in this uh, particular difference to diagnostic consideration is the most important and we usually are quite happy to stay with this. Final uh, question to Professor Slotweg is uh, related or the, the question asks, hyalinization and sclerosis uh, in salivary gland uh, carcinomas, is it associated with more aggressive behavior? Uh, well, no. No, I don't think so. I don't think so because you can, let's say, in particular in a pre-morphed adenoma, you can have hyalinasin and sclerosis. Let's may, maybe I, I remember I had a case, a case of a parotid gland tumor, and it was done. There was done fine needle aspiration, and in the fine needle aspiration, they noted some osteoclasts, and that osteoclasts were they were taken as a sign for bone evasion, bone evasion. And that, and that make, would make the treatment quite aggressive. But then at first, when, when the tumor was taken out, I noted it was just a pleomorphic adenoma with, with, within the pleomorphic adenoma, metaplastic bone formation. And that metaplastic bone formation had some bordering osteoclasts. So the osteoclasts were not a sign of bone resorption indicating aggressive growth, but just belonging to the metaplastic bone formation within the normal, quite normal pleomorphic adenoma. So the hyalinosis, sclerosis in itself doesn't tell anything. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, two more questions uh, just arrived, uh, and one is. Uh, uh, um, putting us back to the previous question, uh, asking differentiation between cellular variant of pleomorphic adenoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma, particularly if there are, is a cribriform pattern in pleomorphic adenoma can be challenging. That's true. And there is another one question about immunohistochemistry between uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, is that P63 versus P40? Of, uh, of any help, because there was a paper, a nice paper, showing that there is a uh, possibility to use different expressions of P63 and P40 uh, between adenoid cystic and, uh, adeno, uh, aden and polymorphous adenocarcinoma. What's your experience, if, uh, if, uh, if do you use it? Well, the point is, the point is that what we are always trying is to relate immune chemistry with cellular phenotype. And almost all saliva gland tumors are composed of a mixture of myoepithelial cells and epithelial cells. So just, just positivity for myoepithelial cells or positivity for ductal cells doesn't tell anything. It's the pattern. It's the pattern that is decisive. And sometimes immune chemistry may make it more easy to recognize the pattern. But quite often it's not. And for me, effect. One useful application is recognizing the ductal cells in epithelial myoepithelial 
carcinoma because the ductal component quite often is rather small and inconspicuous. And then positivity for, let's say, CK7 ductal cells will be helpful in distinguishing between a clear cell myoepithelial carcinoma or an epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma. So far, my experience. Mm, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, dear all, I, I believe that we have been uh, uh, very happy with uh, Professor Slotvek. The, the, the lecture was uh, absolutely wonderful and nobody, dear friend, uh, I do not disagree with you. In most cases, I have absolutely the same opinion as you do. Maybe a little bit uh, there is a difference uh, looking at PARC polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma versus cribriform, but still I am not the, the, the fighting person. I believe that there is a spectrum, but what I am telling is that it could be, it's quite good to be aware of cribriform pattern in the polymorphous adenocarcinoma because simply these uh, cases can be more aggressive uh, in that respect that they give rise to lymph node metastasis and one should be informed about this this uh, pitfall or this uh, this uh, risk, let's say, in clinical behavior. I I I, I don't know if I can um, uh, express my gratitude of for in instead of all participants uh, that we really appreciated your deep knowledge and your uh, uh, wonderful type of presentation. Things I I I really congratulate to you. Thank you so much. Alina, thank you so much. You are, as always, very kind, and hopefully we can meet each other physically in the near future. Exactly. And not exactly. in this way. Yeah, I'm, I'm really missing this uh, physical contact, but still, thanks to our friends in Tehran that we can meet at least on uh, this platform. Yeah, Pujia has been the postillon d'amour. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. So, we have a, I hope that uh, you will stay with us and we'll move to the uh, next uh, speaker who is distinguished friend of mine, I believe as well. We met uh, when I was visiting Tehran University. The next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Farid Asbudeh. Uh, he's a professor of pathology working at the School of Medicine Department Pathology Cancer <laughs> Institute. Uh, Iman Komin Hospital Complex, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, TUMS, and the, the platform is yours now, Professor Farid. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's a great honor for me, and I really want to thank the organizers of uh, this uh, very uh, useful program. Uh, in, in the first slide, you can see the Cancer Institute where I work and we have the opportunity uh, to have some uh, good oral pathologists over here, both residents and uh, attendings uh, come here and help us with difficult cases. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not a head and neck pathologist, but uh, I really uh, sometimes encounter some cases and uh, today I would like uh, to talk about uh, an issue which is uh, a clear cell tumor in the mandibular angle. It's a case-based discussion. I call uh, my lecture, all that glitters is not uh, clear cell carcinoma. Uh, so let's start with the case. Uh, uh, 30, uh, I'm sorry, a 63-year-old man with right uh, protein lesion mass uh, involving the bone and soft tissue on MRI and ill-defined enhancing mass were identified uh, on the right side uh, of the face, mainly involving the mandibular angle with uh, destruction and extension to the bone. Uh, First, we had uh, an incisional biopsy, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, uh, the size of the specimen, uh, there were some fragments of bony and soft tissue uh, aggregating to about uh, one or uh, one and a half centimeter. And as uh, you can see in this image in a part of uh, 
this specimen, uh, we could uh, find uh, clusters, sheets, and nests of uh, cells uh, between the bone trabeculae. And as you can see here, uh, the stroma is uh, fibrotic and the cells uh, in this uh, high power, uh, can we see that uh, they are clear with glomorphic uh, nuclei and the tumor is uh, infiltrative. It has infiltrated the bone trabeculae and even in some areas has extended to surrounding soft tissue. I think from uh, the clinical point of view and morphologic features, there's no doubt that uh, we are encountering a malignant uh, noplasm, which is composed of nests and groups of uh, clear cells. Uh, I would like uh, to have the opinion of uh, the audience, uh, a kind of uh, polling uh, we may have right now. I have uh, two consecutive questions and I want uh, the audience to uh, tell me uh, their uh, you know, uh, opinion about these two uh, consecutive questions. The first question is, what is the big category of the tumor based on morphologic features? Is it the carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, sarcoma, or paraganglioma, mesothelioma, or germ cell? And the next uh, question, which is related to it, is uh, that are, uh, uh, do you think that uh, immunohistochemistry can be uh, helpful in these situations and if you are uh, going to uh, identify the category of the tumor, which uh, initial immunostaining panel uh, do you use? I uh, asked the IT person to launch the uh, polling. Uh, please answer questions one and two. And uh, the first question is, what is the big category of the tumor based on morphologic features. And the second question is, uh, which immunostains uh, do you suggest for initial categorization? I'm sorry, I'm looking at the pooling, pool, pooling uh, in progress. 42 seconds, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so first people are uh, voting for two, two, for uh, number one, carcinoma. So just two participants, uh, so far 100%, three participants for carcinoma. No, nothing else. So all of uh, the participants who are uh, voting are for so should I finish? Uh, yes, but uh, the second question, what's the uh, opinion? Someone says go for sarcoma. There is something, go for sarcoma. Uh, then there is, a, which of the following uh, uh, are your main differential diagnosis based on the H and, H and E sections? There are papillary cystic variant of arsenic, cyst adenocarcinoma. No, uh, no, 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 it's uh, not uh, the correct, uh, you know, polling. It's uh, Dr. <laughs> Cardenis, I think. Okay. Uh, link. So uh, I wrote it. And I, I think uh, poll result. Uh, okay, I think there is some uh, technical problems. If it's not possible, uh, I should proceed. Uh, I but I understood so. that the majority of the people selected uh, carcinoma oh, yes. as a big uh, category yeah. of two more, and uh, that's good. Uh, uh, may I ask to stop the uh, polling? So I still see the carcinoma, three persons, 100%, uh, nothing, uh, nothing else. So I stop for the second question, probably I have seen that uh, and the you know, opinions are dispersed between the first, okay. the second, and fourth uh, options. 
Uh, okay, uh, if uh, it's possible, I would uh, think uh, we can stop the polling and I can continue. Uh, yeah. It's a stop. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I agree with the majority, the tumor from the morphologic point of view is a carcinoma and most instances we do not need to throw any kind of immunostains to uh, understand that it's a carcinoma, the cells are coercive, they are clear and uh, uh, they are uh, most probably carcinomas but uh, when uh, I really have difficulties in categorization uh, of the two more, I uh, return uh, to uh, this question. You know, I sometimes when uh, the immunostains or uh, other uh, studies are not uh, helpful, I return uh, to the big category and I say maybe I have made a mistake. It's uh, probably a melanoma, and I have uh, thought it's a carcinoma, and that was the uh, reason uh, for my problem. In this uh, case, uh, I. Uh, really uh, through a kind of uh, immunostaining in order to be sure that it is a, a carcinoma. When uh, we want to categorize the tumor into the four uh, major groups, which is uh, carcinoma, lymphoma, melanoma, and sarcoma, I think uh, choice C is the uh, better choice for doing such a, uh, you know, classification. Uh, for, with uh, cytocratin for uh, carcinoma, I'll say for lymphoma and sac for melanoma. It can be uh, helpful in uh, hard uh, situations, uh, but probably from the morphologic point of view, uh, lymphoma was not very uh, suggested. Anyhow, uh, the uh, immunostain showed what uh, was expected. Cytocratin was positive, I'll say negative, and Cytocratin was also uh, negative. Uh, the next question uh, we have, and now we can say that we have a clear cell tumor, which is uh, from the morphologic and clinical and imaging point of view, malignant. Uh, this next question is, uh, where is the origin of tumor? Is it a primary tumor of bone, of the mandibular bone? or is it a local extension from oral, oral cavity or parotid gland or minor cervical glands of the oral cavity, or is it metastasis from somewhere else? It is the question that we must answer in these uh, situations. Let's, uh, let's first take a look at uh, the salivary gland carcinomas with killer cell appearance. Uh, Professor Slutberg uh, had a very uh, good discussion. I, I don't want to uh, discuss it anymore. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, say that mucoepidermal carcinoma, asthmic cell carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, oncocytic carcinoma, myotelial carcinoma, epithelial myotelial carcinoma, sebaceous adenoid carcinoma, and sometimes salivary duct carcinoma may uh, have uh, clear cells uh, and they can, may produce uh, clear cell appearance. But uh, as it was uh, discussed in the previous uh, section, uh, we have some morphologic features which can really help us to differentiate and we really do not need immunostaining, for instance, uh, when we have mucin and we can uh, confirm presence of mucin by just a mucin carmine stain, we can say it's a mucoepidermal carcinoma or if we find uh, bluish granules, basically granules, we can say it's asthmic cell carcinoma and for oncocytoma or oncocytic uh, carcinoma, probably part of the tumor shows oncocytic uh, differentiation and epithelial myothelial carcinoma. Uh, Professor Slutbeck showed a very uh, good uh, image of this tumor. It has two components, epithelial and myoepithelial uh, components. Sometimes both components, both epithelial and myoepithelial are clear in this uh, cases it may be a little bit difficult uh, to differentiate it from a pure uh, clear cell tumor. Sebaceous adenocarcinoma uh, are uh, the differential diagnosis. Uh, I think uh, we need here uh, a little bit of immunostaining for differentiation when uh, morphology alone is not healthy. 
As I told you in the first step for ruling out melanoma, I uh, had a SAX-10 uh, immunostaining which shows a negative result. My next uh, question is, uh, uh, is this immunostain helpful for uh, separating uh, or uh, ruling out some of the differential diagnosis? The answer is that uh, yes, uh, in, so, in some uh, references, uh, the salivary gland tumors are divided into sex 10 positive and sex 10 negative groups. And as uh, you can see, uh, there are some uh, sex 10 positive tumors, such as Asenixer tumor myoptelial carcinoma, uh, and uh, from and, and the clear so epithelial myoptelial carcinoma is a sax 10 positive, but the sax 10 was negative in uh, our case. And based on this negative result, uh, you may say that uh, the possibility of these tumors are less. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, as I've mentioned in this question, and I think it's uh, also a good uh, option is that nothing can be excluded based on a negative result. You know, when you have a negative result, you must first of all be sure that uh, you do not have any technical problem. Uh, presence of internal controls is very important. And the other point is that no tumor is a hundred percent. You know, no marker has a hundred percent uh, specificity and sens sensitivity for identifying tumors. And uh, because of this low uh, sensitivity that in uh, good markers is something about 80 or 90%. If a marker is negative, we cannot uh, say that uh, that special tumor uh, is not uh, and should not be considered. Uh, P63 and cytokratine 7. Uh, as you can see, the acinic cell carcinoma, myotelial carcinoma, epithelial myocarcinoma, uh, should be uh, saxon positive, they were negative, they were excluded. P63 and cytokratine 7 were also negative. So uh, at this point, uh, I really did the cytokratine 19, it was also negative, and I uh, really thought that a salivary gland origin is less likely based on these uh, immunochemical findings. And then uh, as to the primary Carcinomas with mandible, uh, uh, Dr. Merva in this uh, first uh, session talked about the odontogenic carcinomas. And uh, I should say there are a large number of uh, these kind of carcinomas and probably uh, the only one uh, which is uh, more uh, suggested from the morphologic point of view is clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. But, uh, cytokratin uh, 19 was negative in our case. It was a little bit uh, against it. Then uh, let's go uh, to the metastatic tumors that can have uh, killer cell appearance, uh, carcinoma, melanoma, germ cell, and paraganglioma. Melanoma and paraganglioma based on the initial uh, panel is excluded because uh, sextin was negative and cytokratin is positive germ cell. Tumor is a little bit unlikely in a patient at this age. Therefore, uh, carcinoma, uh, most probably from kidney and thyroid are the main differential diagnosis with the uh, killer cell feature uh, as cytokratin 7 was negative. So uh, thyroid is less probable. Uh, here you can see the panel we had for clear cell carcinoma of the uh, kidney, uh, we uh, performed PAX-8 immunostaining, which was negative. And uh, the only marker that was strongly positive was CD10. And after uh, this uh, immunostaining and this morphologic features, uh, I uh, rendered this diagnosis, clear cell carcinoma. Prob probably metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma uh, because uh, of strong CD10 positivity despite negative result of PAX-8. Uh, here I would like uh, to know the uh, opinion of the audience about uh, what I, ha I am signing out this case. Is it correct? Uh, is it a good assumption or not? Uh, Dr. Merva in the first uh, uh, you know, lecture said that a very good marker for clear cell carcinoma 
of the uh, kidney is PAX8, but PAX8 was negative in our case, but CD10 was positive. Uh, okay, I think there is a, a problem with uh, the polling. Uh, probably uh, they uh, can send me their uh, opinions uh, in the comment. Uh, and the polling is launched and uh, I think now the third, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth question should be answered. Uh, do you agree with this diagnosis? Uh, clear cell, renal cell carcinoma. A clear cell carcinoma, most probably metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. First one agrees. First one agrees. Four, four people agree. No idea once. <laughs> Uh, eight people agree with uh, your diagnosis. Two, two of us, no idea. No idea. <laughs> no idea. Nobody disagrees. <laughs> nobody disagrees. It's very good. You know, uh, uh, ten people, eighty-three percent agrees. Should I stop yeah. it? It's good that I'm not alone in no, making mistakes alone. like this. <laughs> Okay, uh, may I ask to end the polling? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, now let me tell you something about the follow-up of the patient. Uh, on the follow-up, no tumor was found in the kidneys on US study. And after further clinical workup, with the clinical assumption of a primary tumor in the mandibular uh, region, partial mandibulectomy, and resection of surrounding soft tissues, including part of the uh, parotid gland was done. The parotid gland was uh, absolutely free from tumor. And as you can see here, we had bone trabeculae and the tumor which infiltrates between the bone trabeculae, the sheets of the cells, the cure cell appearance, the fibrotic uh, stroma around it uh, was something like what I had in the incisional biopsy, but uh, as you can see, the tumor was inside the bone with uh, so, uh, extension to surrounding soft tissue. In some areas, uh, the tumor shows a completely different pattern, as you can see, uh, here I can see glands, very good well-formed glands are seen here and uh, they are less clear. Uh, here the gland formation can be seen and uh, as uh, you can see in, uh, half of the uh, slide shows a tumor which is uh, relatively clear and the other half it's not clear but it has formed glands. And so I think it's an adenocarcinoma, uh, probably a static adenocarcinoma here. I really would like to thank my talented colleague, Dr. Hanna Safar, uh, who will have a lecture uh, after me. Uh, you know, uh, he suggested the possibility of a prosthetic uh, adenocarcinoma with metastasis to the uh, you know, mandible. And so I uh, did some uh, more immunostains, stains, P uh, PSA was positive, and uh, another immunostain, uh, uh, NKX3.1, which is transcription factor for prosthetic adenocarcinoma, was also positive. So uh, further workup approved uh, presence of metastatic uh, uh, prosthetic adenocarcinoma in our patient, and uh, I was uh, completely wrong, and it was, uh, you know, uh, the patient was probably uh, mismanaged. Uh, here you can, uh, after uh, this, uh, I really found an article which is not a very uh, new one, it's published in 2000, and it really shows that uh, CD10 can be positive in a very uh, vast majority of uh, carcinomas, including genital urinary tract carcinomas, and about, as you can see here, 61% of prosthetic adenocarcinomas carcinomas, it can be positive in gastrointestinal tract carcinomas, it can be also positive. That's why uh, PAX-8 really 
has substituted uh, uh, CD10 for uh, such a distinction and uh, probably uh, I should say uh, from, uh, you know, I think the take home messages from the uh, mistake that I made is that nothing can replace a good clinical workup probably uh, in an old patient, uh, prosthetic adenocarcinoma is very common, uh, but metastasis of a prosthetic adenocarcinoma to uh, the mandibular area as the presenting feature is very rare, is uh, seen in less than one uh, percent of the cases. Here you can see uh, the article, a very nice article, which uh, discusses this issue. And the most important message is that morphology and immunostaining uh, should be interpreted uh, judiciously and uh, they can be sometimes misleading. Uh, we must be careful. Uh, CD10 positivity, as you can see, is not a very specific marker. It can be positive in genital urinary tract and GI tract uh, uh, carcinomas and Clear cell change uh, is uh, a feature that may be observed in uh, many other carcinomas, including the prosthetic adenocarcinoma. carcinoma. If uh, I just wanted to approach to a carcinoma or adenocarcinoma, probably I could reach the correct answer, but uh, this was uh, the pitfall that I, uh, you know, tried to follow the clear cell morphology and this really uh, made uh, to this mistake. Thank you very much. Uh, I would be very happy to know uh, the comments uh, of uh, the colleagues, Professor uh, Skalova and Professor Slutberg uh, about this case. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for great case and great presentation. Uh, and I'm just reading the comments from the participants. Excellent case. Thank you for sharing. Very informative, very wonderful case. You did get a good job, and all these, uh, all the comments are very positive. And so, so I share the comments, and maybe the message is that Pax Aid is useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Pax Aid, yeah. I think, is a much thank better so much. marker than yeah, CD. Thank you so much. I think right. we are a little bit in lack of time, uh, Professor Puyan. I guess that we should continue. Or do you think so? Do yes, exactly. Thank, thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, it seems that we have not enough time for sharing the questions. Mm. Yes, please. I, I, I will be grateful if uh, the audience share their uh, questions um, uh, via email. Uh, yeah, we will uh, let uh, the audience know in chat box and we will back to them via email. Thank yeah. you. Uh, more, more or less what I can see are just uh, thanks and thanks. Not very many questions, but uh, appreciation that uh, that was excellent case. So I suggest to move to the other speaker. Then our next speaker is uh, uh, assist pro pro assistant professor, Dr. Hannah Safar. Uh, she is uh, a uh, assistant professor at School of Medicine, Department of Pathology, Iman Khomeini Hospital, Tehran. Uh, University of Medical Sciences. Uh, Hannah, that's your platform is yours. Good luck. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, dear Professor Skalaba. Uh, it's really my pleasure to participate in uh, this uh, valuable Congress with uh, expert head and pathologists. And, um, of course, uh, I uh, have to thank dear organizers. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this Congress. And uh, I also uh, thank uh, Professor Azmudev for uh, his uh, kind opinions and for his uh, supportive personality. Uh, we work in the same center and I'm so happy uh, because uh, I can have always his valuable comments in all my cases. Uh, thank you, dear Professor Azmudev, too much. Okay, uh, I think it's better to start because of the lack of time. Um, my, case, my case is a 49-year-old man with right alveolar ridge mass. Uh, 
uh, mandibular bone destruction and cervical lymphadenopathy. He presented with cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, okay, as you can see here, this is a CT scan with contrast. As you can see here, uh, the lesion is located here in a uh, mandibular bone and uh, some uh, destruction to the bone is, uh, has happened. So it has destructed bone in some parts. And it's, as you can see again, uh, this is uh, an ill-defined border. We can see ill-defined border. So the lesion is uh, probably an infiltrated lesion. Uh, okay, here this is uh, without contrast, and uh, as you can see here, the lesion is, uh, because uh, this is image is with, uh, without contrast, the lesion is somehow uh, darker than the previous one. And uh, in this picture, again, you can see cervical lymphadenopathy in this patient. Again, here you can see a posterior extension of the tumor. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, up to now, I think at least we know that this is uh, more probably a malignant lesion because it's infiltrative, it has causes bone de destruction and cervical lymphadenopathy. So uh, let's see uh, microscopic images. As uh, you can see here, uh, these are tumors. Actually, in this picture, we can't see uh, borders of the lesion, but the borders were all infiltrative in all sides. And uh, you can see here arrangement of tumor cells, sometimes in a cripriform maybe pattern. There are few spaces here and there, and uh, some uh, vascular co um, fibrous cores are present here. Um, in next image, uh, you can uh, appreciate a nice uh, crib reform pattern. And as you can see again, uh, tumoral cells are divided uh, into several nests by fibrotic bundles. So as you can see here, uh, the tumor is some, uh, the tumor has somehow nodular appearance. Again, in this picture, uh, you can see creep reform architecture here, solid growing of tumoral cells, and sometimes a uh, nest of tumoral cells which are separated by fibrous bands. Uh, and as you can see here, this uh, group reform pattern is more evident here. And again, you can appreciate fibrotic bundles and that separate the tumor cells to different nodules. Here again, you can see, for example, here um, ductal structures, somehow papillary-like structures, and sometimes you can see arrangements of tumor cells between clefts. Um, it makes a glomerulate-like appearance somehow. And uh, when you look in high power to the nuclear morphology, uh, you can see that uh, nuclei of tumor are optically clear, somehow grand glass appearance. And as you can appreciate, the chromatin is condensed in peripheral borders of the nuclei. So um, it's, it's somehow reminiscent of papillary thyroid carcinoma, I think. Again, as you can see here, we have uh, here papillary structures and uh, nuclei are again optically clear. And um, uh, also you can find some longitudinal grooves in the nuclei. And I think uh, it is very reminiscent of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So I think uh, particularly when they encounter a metastatic lymph node, uh, we should be very, very careful for diagnosis. Uh, you can see where nerve bundles, uh, uh, spreading of tumor cells to nerve bundles. Nerve bundles are entrapped here. And again, in this slide, there's a nerve bundle which is completely entrapped by tumor cells. Uh, okay, this is the one of the cervical lymph nodes of the patient. And as you can see here, uh, these areas are normal lymph node, and the tumor has infiltrated a part of the lymph node. But as you can see, there is no evidence of extra nodal extension. Again, from the higher power, uh, these areas of normal lymph nodes are seen here. And uh, in this area, the part of uh, the lymph node is effaced by tumoral cells. 
Uh, okay, this is my last microscopic slide, and I think because the lack of time, I have to, imme have to jump immediately to the uh, approach to the uh, tumor and to the diagnosis. Uh, I think uh, when uh, we gather all this data together, we have an infiltrative tumor, uh, so it's malignant. We have pre-neural pre -neural spreading of tumor cells. We have a lymph, cervical lymph node involvement. So it seems that this is a malignant tumor and the behavior is, uh, in my opinion, actually it's not somehow low grade. We don't um, expect in low grade tumors to behave like this most of the times, uh, of course. Okay, cribriform adenocarcinoma of tongue, of tongue was first discovered by Michael and uh, Professor Scalova in original series in, in 1999. Uh, fortunately, we are uh, so lucky today to have uh, dear Professor Scalova uh, with us and um, so it's uh, very, uh, we are too lucky to have her valuable comments here. Uh, after that, uh, the original series were, were all located in tongue, but after a while, there were some other cases with similar histomorphologic features, and uh, these cases were located in um, other sites, like soft palate, hard palate, retromolar area, and other uh, minor salivary gland regions. So the name Cripriform adenocarcinoma of tongue, the abbreviation was CAT, was changed to Cripriform adenocarcinoma minor salivary glands. Uh, if uh, I want, if uh, I think it's better to uh, take a, a brief look to the literature. Uh, most of the cribriform adenocarcinomas were previously diagnosed as polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. You know, and now we say polymorphous adenocarcinoma. PLGA was um, refers to the time before 2017 classification of tumors. But these uh, polymorphous adenocarcinomas, most of the time, had several lymph node involvement. So uh, as you know better than me, this is not a common feature in polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade. So it seems that something would be different between these uh, tumors. Um, there's an interesting case located, by, um, reported by Luco et al. Uh, their case was like this. For example, there was a patient who referred uh, with a mass lesion in a floor of mouth, and uh, the mass underwent excision, and the diagnosis was proliferating polymorphic adenoma. Three months later, the patient referred with cervical lymph adenopathy, and uh, she underwent uh, FNA. The FNA uh, was suspicious for popular thyroid carcinoma. The ultrasound of thyroid didn't reveal any uh, nodular regions in the thyroid. So they decided to review slides of the tumor of the patients, which was located in uh, floor of mouth. So after reviewing the slides, they discovered that this tumor could be diagnosed as uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma. So because the similarities uh, to uh, nuclear similarities to papillary thyroid carcinoma, uh, we should be very careful. Uh, generally, uh, cribriform adenocarcinomas can involve patients in wide age range. For example, mean age is about uh, 57 years. Uh, and both men and women could be equally uh, affected. They can be located in tongue, buccal mucosa, lip, palate, and um, uh, any other minor cyber gland. And about half of the cases be, uh, present with cervical lymphadenopathy at the time of their presentation. On cross-examination, the tumor is usually unencapsulated with firm consistency. Surface epithelium is usually intact. On microscopic examination, different kinds of architectures could be present. For example, grip reform, tubular, solid, papillary, and uh, as uh, in uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, I mean polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade, uh, we know that these tumors are characterized by 
diverse uh, architectures and uniformity in uh, cytological features. So this uh, architecture, uh, this uh, diverse ar architecture could be also seen in cribriform adenocarcinomas. Sometimes glomerulite-like structures are seen, foci of necrosis, and sometimes somatype calcifications are also present. Uh, again, on microscopic examination, um, as I uh, showed you in the pictures, the tumor cells are separated by fibrotic bundles to different nodules. And as I again showed you, the nuclei are somehow moderate to large owl, sometimes optically clear, completely reminiscent of popular thyroid carcinoma. And uh, as um, I can show you in this picture, this is uh, Orphanani. Orphanani, as you know, is the name of the movie, which was uh, popular many years ago in the United States. And uh, these uh, her eyes, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, nuclei in popular thyroid carcinoma because of the peripheral condensation of chromatin are somehow it seems to be empty, like orphan any eyes. Uh, and uh, um, actually, orphan any uh, had eyes with dot, and her all her dog's eyes were exactly like hers. So we can see uh, these are like orphan and dog's eyes. So um, they are completely optically clear. In IHC study, tumor cells are positive for broad spectrum, spectrum cytocratins like protein A1, A3, uh, cytocratin 7, like other cerebral gland tumors, and uh, strong uh, positivity for S100, which is extremely helpful for differentiating this tumor from other mimickers. And these tumors are usually negative for P40, uh, and uh, TTF1 should be negative as the rule to uh, exclude probability of popular thyroid carcinoma. Variable expressions for other markers like P63 and cytocratin uh, 5.6 could be seen. And in genetic study, recent studies have shown that in a cribriform adenocarcinomas, um, PRKD1 or PRKD2, PRKD3 uh, fusions are rearranged with other partner genes. Uh, would be seen. And we know in cribriform, uh, in the polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade, most of the time PRKD1, PRKD1 um, activating mutations are seen. So these fusions and rearrangements are more in favor of cribriform uh, adenocarcinoma. Okay, these are beautiful images from original series uh, described by uh, Professor Scala Varital, and they are uh, very, I think, beautiful images separating of tumor cells uh, by fibrotic bundles, cribriform architectures, sometimes foci of type necrosis in the center of tumor cells. Again, cribriform architectures, you can see here uh, some uh, tubular structures monolayer tubular structures are present here. And uh, when uh, we want to differentiate this tumor from other mimickers, the first uh, tumor which should be excluded is polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade. As you know, in polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade, uh, we most of the time have uh, one uh, characteristic streaming uh, arrangement of uh, tumor cells in course, particularly in periphery of the tumor that uh, creates a targeted, -like appear targeted appearance. But this feature is not usually seen in cribriform adenocarcinoma. Another significant differential diagnosis, as I discussed previously, is papillary thyroid carcinoma. Fortunately, with IHC markers, we, are, uh, easy, we can easily differentiate between these tumors. Uh, among four years, uh, during these four years, uh, I have experience of three uh, cases of uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma. One of them was a 34-year-old man presented uh, with tongue lesion and cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, FNA of the patient, again, was in favor of a papillary thyroid carcinoma, but again, ultrasound showed normal thyroid parenchyma. And on MRI examination, an ill-defined mass lesion was uh, discovered at base of tongue. Uh, 
actually this was a consultation case and uh, we didn't have gross specimen of we didn't receive gross specimen of the patient but after surgery uh, the first pathologist reported uh, the uh, tumor as carcinoma with ptc like nuclear features maybe ptc raised on a heterotopic thyroid tissue and he recommended ic study and uh, when uh, this case uh, came to our center we performed IC study and uh, we found that this is a cribriform adenocarcinoma, I mean, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, cribriform type, and the patient is tumor free after two years follow up now. Another patient was a 69 year old man, woman, excuse me, with tongue lesion and no cervical lymph node involvement. She is again tumor free after two years uh, follow up. So in conclusion, uh, something like take home message, uh, we should uh, know that it's important to differentiate polymorphous adenocarcinoma cribriform type from polymorphous adenocarcinoma low grade. Because as you know, polymorphous uh, cribriform adenocarcinomas uh, in uh, 2017 classification of head and neck tumors are still under umbrella of uh, polymorphous adenocarcinomas. So, um, why it's important to differentiate between these two kinds? It's important because the behavior is somehow different. We know that polymorphous adenocarcinoma cribriform types uh, are not most of the time low grade tumors. They are sometimes they could be uh, intermediate grade or even high grade, and uh, they can involve cervical lymph nodes. Uh, and so this is important for treatment of patient because patient can uh, receive, um, uh, for example. Uh, cervical nipple dissection and even radiation after that. So it's very important to differentiate these kinds of tumors. Uh, thank you very much again for your attention. This was my last slide. This is a uh, references which I use. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Hannah for uh, giving us so, uh, so, so educative and well-designed uh, um, case report and wonderful presentation. Uh, I recognize it immediately. This is sometimes diagnosis of three seconds, but thank you for presenting this case. And this seems to me that the cases or presentations like this uh, is the reason why uh, these entities uh, I agree that it's a spectrum. Sometimes we can see really sure uh, um, a gray zone, but in typical cases like your your one, uh, the diagnosis is right straightforward. Thank you for presenting so in in so wonderful way this this case. It was really my pleasure. Thank you very much, dear professor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about uh, the time schedule? Uh, I believe that we are really, really uh, behind the schedule and I should probably uh, move to the last presentation and the discussion will be somehow organized on, uh, on email basis or online basis. So let's uh, proceed uh, and we, we, we shall have the last speaker, Assistant Professor, uh, hello. Uh, Dr. Neda Cardoni, uh, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, School of Dentistry, Tehran University of uh, Medical Sciences. That's your time. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Escalova, for Professor Escalova, for kindly introducing me. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to be among uh, respectful expertise at this time today. And uh, I uh, am going to share my case, uh, which was a consultation case in a um, very uh, brief time. A 52 year old man uh, with left parotid uh, mass was referred uh, to another institute in one of the uh, Iran cities and uh, he was suffering from pain for a few days. Uh, as a routine workup for the head and neck mass patients, 
uh, MRI, MRI will take uh, will take and will be taken and um, as as was done for this patient, a mass with a defined border on left parotid gland, which involved both superficial and deep parotid lobes, uh, was identified on MRI. And uh, furthermore, MRI imaging was uh, used for um, for the measurement of the size of this mass, which was. 30 millimeter by 16 millimeter in size uh, with multiple, multiple lymph and hematopathies. And uh, it shows irregular borders as well. Uh, FNA was done for a patient and um, a syringe containing 2 ml of fluid, bloody fluid uh, was obtained. Uh, under the microscopic examination, only macrophages in a bloody background was found and nothing more. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the patient underwent total peritidectomy and the specimen was referred for pathologic evaluation. And finally, as a consultation case, we have received 15 slide and blo related blocks in our center and these are the microscopic sections, H and E stained slides, uh, which, um, as you can see here, um, a tumor composed of multiple islands uh, of solid islands, um, mostly composed of uniform um, and um, monotonous epithelial cells, uh, can be seen in this slide. Furthermore, you can find some um, islands and cribriform structures, which are surrounded by, but by somehow hyalinizing stroma or uh, dense fibrotic stroma, as we can see. Uh, the solid growth pattern um, and the cribriform are also evident in this slide, and uh, some some secretions, eosinophilic secretions. Uh, can be seen in between the cells, which uh, make the uh, cribriform structure for uh, us. And also along with this uh, solidness and islands, we have dilated ducts, uh, which are uh, somehow um, looking like uh, cystic spaces. And um, also together uh, with these cystic spaces, we can see these um, islands and solid nests uh, with cribriform structures. And here we can see some projection of the uh, epithelial proliferation into the lumina of the cysts, um, somehow looking like a hobnail appearance for the uh, tumor. And in higher magnification, you can see a, a tumoral nest with uniform, uh, small, um, somehow rounded to epithelial cells with uh, scans and eosinophilic pale cytoplasm and a nuclei with mild atypical, uh, mild atypia and uh, surrounded by a thin layer of um, flattened cells at the periphery. Uh, may I ask the IT person to share uh, our polling question, please? Based on the previous uh, HNE stain sections and the clinical history of the patient, which one of the following is the best um, choice for your differential diagnosis, your, your main differential diagnosis. A 52-year-old uh, man with such a uniform, uh, somehow uh, mild atypical uh, epithelial uh, tumor. Okay. As it can be seen, I think the uh, choice B, uh, the choice B has 
uh, has the highest percentage. Uh, am I right? That in Professor Escalaba. Unmute. Uh, the, the second choice, cystadenocarcinoma versus low-grade intradactyl, was the most uh, favorite one. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, when you have such a tumor, epithelial tumor somehow uh, with low-grade uh, malignancy or something which is not um, related to high grade transformation, you may list, uh, you may uh, face a list of uh, differential diagnoses. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have written a list of differential diagnoses here. Um, varying from uh, benign conditions such as cyst adenoma, sclerosing polycystic adenosis, ductal adenoma with striated ductal differentiation, and intercalated ductal hyperplasia or adenoma. And you may consider low grade malignant tumors in the differential diagnosis, including cyst adenocarcinoma or uh, in situ salivary duct carcinoma as well. And finally, um, you, you may have a look or you may across in your mind uh, around the high-grade malignant tumors that uh, these malignant, uh, high-grade malignant tumors uh, are listed maybe at the bottom of your list, um, high-grade intraductal carcinoma, conventional salivary duct carcinoma, papillary cystic variant of acinic cell carcinoma, and mammary adenoid secretory carcinoma. Um, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I hope, I'm very happy, happy that I have um, the chance of uh, doing IHC and um, really um, helping of IHC um, give me more, um, more accessibility for the diagnosis. I mean, by S114 positivity of the tumoral nest and P63 uh, 63 positivity for the peripheral cells at the periphery of the islands, um, it, it makes it uh, more clear that uh, we are faced to a, a tumor which has um, a component of intraductal uh, uh, growth uh, which is S100 positive and a nanoplastic cells, which are uh, lower in population, I mean, the, um, at the periphery of the islands. And uh, really, I did uh, more ISCs, uh, including KI67 and high molecular weight cytocratin, as well as DOG1 for uh, making the diagnosis more precise. And um, as can be seen here uh, at the patient report, the dog one was negative in tumoral cells, but uh, high, molecular was, uh, high molecular weight cytocratin was positive and um, diffuse intense positivity for this marker was seen. Uh, the CARE 67 was minimal and it was uh, negligible. And According to this panel of IHC, uh, me and Dr. Mahdavi uh, decided to sign up this case as a low-grade adenocarcinoma with significant intraductal growth pattern, suggesting of intraductal uh, low-grade carcinoma. And uh, because it was a consultation case, the uh, marginal statement couldn't be uh, performed and the statement of surgical margins cannot be ruled out. Uh, briefly, I just uh, want to give you uh, an overview about the low-grade salivary duct carcinoma because Professor, um, Professor uh, Slutwick, he uh, mentioned um, really um, highlighted things and uh, clues about this entity and also as well Dr. Scalova, she uh, shared us a new um, publication uh, which um, she had done about the um, tumor which has an invasive component as well as inside the component. Uh, the low-grade intraductal carcinoma was first described by 
by Delgado in 1996, and it was entitled as low-grade salivary carcinoma. But in 2005, WHO publication uh, was renamed the, this tumor as a low-grade uh, cribriform cystadenocarcinoma. And according to the latest WHO 2017 classification, it categorized as low-grade intraductal carcinoma. But the percentage of using this term is very, very less than the uh, two former. Regarding to epidemiology and clinical feature, it's uh, a very really, um, rare neoplasm. And uh, up to now, according to a systematic review, uh, which I am giving uh, you um, their, um, their experience, uh, 54 cases uh, have been reported around the globe. And uh, adults with a wide age spectrum ranging from 27 to 93 year old are affected. And there is a slight uh, female predilection for this uh, tumor. The parotid gland is the main site followed by accessory parotid and submandibular gland and less probably minor salivary gland. Uh, asymptomatic slow growth in mass with no facial nerve paralysis uh, may help you to consider this entity in your differentials. Low grade introductal carcinoma uh, has both intracystic and uh, introductal growth pattern. And um, the luminal ductal phenotype with land microscopic feature is uh, one of the uh, main microscopic feature resembling the spectrum of breast lesion. Atypical ductal hyperplasia to micropapillary and cribriform low-grade breast carcinoma in site two. Uh, as, as I were reviewed the literature for giving you the proposed criteria of the diagnosis of this entity, I faced to a, a table uh, which could help us to, um, to differentiate it and, uh, with its um, microscopic features. The presence of cribriform solids and micropapillary as well as chromodon necrosis um, architecture can help us uh, to differentiate this tumor and it has low intermediate or high grade appearance. Demonstration of non neoplastic myoepithelial cells by immunohistochemistry could help us as well to uh, reconfirm the diagnosis. Exclusion of an invasive complaint by trough sampling could be done to be sure about the, the non presence of uh, this invasive component. About the uh, immunohistochemical findings, uh, my slides are not sharing, I think. Uh, uh, there's a technical problem, okay. Um, the IC findings uh, showed for the predominant cells that um, the cytocratin, pancytocratin AE1, AE3, EMA are positive in ductile predominant cells. And for the rimming of my epithelial cells, SMA, calconin, P63, and cytocratin 14 were positive. Uh, in both, in, uh, in both ductiles and ductile and nanoplastic my epithelial cells, high molecular uh, weight cytocratin and uh, MIB1 uh, proliferative intakes less than 1% uh, could be helpful in absence of ER, PR, AR, and HER2 uh, markers uh, could be helpful as well. These are the two, um, I mean, the first one is um, one of the uh, main systematic review, a review of literature, which was um, in the English literature and was published in uh, 2013. Um, and they were considered this entity and the differential diagnosis in a very comprehensive way. And the latest one, which is published um, at the Journal of Oral Biology and Clinical Facial Research in 2019 uh, was the um, latest one. 
and uh, according to their differential diagnosis, uh, I will quickly go through.